It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small used aircraft. Thing not working. Freaking A, man. Across distances they were never meant to fly. This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. Uh, there's a right way to fly an airplane and there's a wrong way. Out here, there are no guarantees. I can't see anything, nothing. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. And no time for fair weather flyers. <laughs> but as long as there's money and fuel to burn, Let's roll. they'll do whatever it takes. Seriously, this could be really bad. To get it there. Black out there, Capitan. Black is the color of trouble for pilots Corey Benson and Randy McGeehee. Well, with no moon and a bunch of clouds, we're not going to be able to see much. Well, we really don't want to be here right now. This is not uh, where we want to be at all. Corey and Randy have been driving full bore for weeks. Oh, my. Exhausted, they pushed off again, leaving Florida in a Beechcraft Bonanza bound for Brazil. Then, a strict airport rule about landing after sundown Damn it. left them in limbo above the Caribbean. We're climbing out of there. We're going to Grenada. Now, dead tired, they face another hour in the air, and their daylight is done. Or a single-engine airplane with no visual reference at night over the ocean going into an unfamiliar airport with a controller that we can barely understand his accent. November 901 Whiskey Echo, request position. 901 Whiskey Echo is nine, eight miles out from the GND Gulf November Delta v one In the dark, they're forced to rely completely on their instruments. Look out there. All you can see is black. There are no lights. There's no horizon. There's nothing. I mean, it's sensory deprivation right now. Even with instruments to help guide them, with no horizon line to refer to, a pilot can be tricked by how his body feels. We have no sense of movement. We have no sense of space. We have no sense of altitude. It's just not a real comfortable feeling, you know? There's a lot of pilots that have died just because of that. They feel like they're in a turn or in a climb or a descent when the plane's actually going straight, so they'll bank into something where they shouldn't, and they end up crashing. There's a lot of black, there's a lot of water, not a lot of options. And on the island of Grenada, where they're about to land, the options aren't great either. We got a lot of things stacked against us. We're surrounded by 3,000 foot mountains in all directions. Bottom line, there's no messing around on this and there's no margin for error. I might ask for information. I need you to really be focused for me. Roger that, Captain. You let your guard down for a minute and it's fatal. Where are we in sight? Uh, 9-1 Whiskey Echo. Ready to put this plane on the ground. Hang on, fellas. Welcome to Granada, boys. Well done, Capitan. <laughs> Holy I seriously thought that was going to be the easiest leg of our entire trip. I certainly hope we don't have anything that risky again, you know? Dude, you, you rocked on that approach. If I was with some of my other buddies, I would have been really fast. Well, I couldn't have done it without you, so. We did it, though. Good job, man. 14 time zones away. It's a new day, and a whole new world 
for ferry pilot Carrie McCauley. Nice. This is a sexy looking jet. I can't wait to fly it. This is the Phenom 100, a highly computerized executive jet with a three and a half million dollar price tag. Very cool. It's aviation's next generation, and Carrie's playing catch up. Been ferry flying uh, for quite a while now, since 1989. And it's kind of hard to uh, get up to speed with some of the new stuff. You know, you get comfortable with old technology. Let's uh, get some power back though. We're doing 110 now. A veteran seat of the pants pro, Carrie's like a race car driver. He prefers his ride hands on. Now, this is why I ferry fly. Who else gets a chance to do this? Woo -hoo. <laughs> Woo. That was cool. In the cockpit of a propeller plane, Carrie is king. Watch your speed. But on this trip, Carrie's the one taking orders. Oh, my goodness. What are the odds? There are two phenoms in Australia. I flew both of them here, and they're one behind each other. The Phenom Master is pilot Marcio Lucchese. It has its computers to do a lot of things, but the primary flight controls are mechanical. Marcio has flown around a dozen of these birds for Jet Aviva, a high-end delivery firm. But when it comes to jets, Carrie's a virgin. First time flying a jet, first time flying with Marcio or even meeting Marcio. So we're all ready to go. And first time being a co-pilot in almost a quarter of a century, <laughs> 25 years since I haven't been the one what's in charge. Oh, yeah. That is back. Now, together, they're taking this plane on a 14-stop run to Las Vegas. OK, now we're going to find out if she's healthy or not. Wow, this is, this is cool. It's like space shuttle. Yeah, in use, there's nothing more modern than this. Everything is automatic. There's always a computer behind it. Yeah, good. The whole plane is really kind of a flying computer. It's going to take me two days to study the manual just to figure out how to turn the damn thing on. Let's start this bad boy, see what she says. Initializing system. Tall system failure. Tall system failure. That's not good. Tall system failure. We're, we're, big, we're in trouble here. Cause system failure. In Carrie's world, when the plane won't start, he calls for a mechanic. Cause system failure. Marcio, he calls tech support. I have the cast box with a big red X on it. So what do I do? How do I cancel the damn, you know, the, there's an there's alarm here going dang, dang, dang. He's, he's spitting out words like, updates and multifunctioning displays. But if the computer's not working, nothing's working. Let's do that. Let's call, call these people. In the Caribbean, Carrie's boss is working overtime. If everything goes as planned, we should be in Manaus uh, early afternoon. Good morning, sir. Corey has just one thing on his mind right now, his schedule. He and Randy have logged more than 2,700 kilometers from Florida across the Caribbean. From here, they'll zigzag down Brazil to their final stop. Dude, I'm pumped to actually get into Brazil. We've had some long days, short nights, and we're tired. Corey's got Randy on a short leash. Fast turnarounds, no downtime. I mean, we're just we're too tired, we're too beat up, it's too hot. That fatigue's gonna catch up with us, man. Today, Corey and Randy have to cover nearly 1,800 kilometers, most of it over dense Brazilian jungle. Run into trouble here, and it's a guaranteed crash landing with lousy odds of survival. There's no wires, there's no roads, there's no tracks of any kind. It's just a bunch of jungle down there. They need to stay sharp. <laughs> but fatigue is now in full flight. It's like Beavis and Butthead <laughs> flying the most dangerous missions in the world. <laughs> All we can talk about is... <laughs> 
six or eight year old is humor type stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to call it, right? <laughs> Jumping time zones, being at altitude. If you're tired, you're physically drained, you can make a stupid decision. And you're dead because of it. Yeah, tomorrow might be a good day for a rest day, man, because we're totally losing it here. What tank are we on now? I don't know. Left, I think. They need to pull it together. Ahead of them, 3,300 kilometers across some of the most unforgiving terrain on the planet. Man, I'm tired, man. I'm hurt. Me too. This has been a long few days. Corey and Randy are out of steam, and now they're also running out of clear skies. Corey, those things are at least 30,000 feet. Look at that thing, man. All this stuff's gonna be right in the middle of our path. Detouring around these storms is eating up time. They have the fuel for it. What they're low on is daylight. The biggest hazard is just the sun going down, us not making our destination in time, and then uh, not being able to see. Near the equator, the sun drops fast. And having tangled with the dark once already on this trip, this might have been a mistake. Randy's not anxious for a repeat. There's a term in aviation called get homeitis. A lot of accidents have happened because people don't want to take the extra time to wait or turn around. I mean, the last two trips, we keep pushing it into the evening and night. The you know, sun is setting uh, pretty fast, but got to get this plane down there. They're within spitting distance of their destination but they've lost their race with the sun. Well, there's Manaus. I see her. Manaus, uh, 91 Whiskey Echo. Uh, can we start a descent, please? I'm in a 91 Whiskey Echo. Clear down 1,500 feet. Thank you, sir. We're cleared down to 1,500 feet, uh, 91 Whiskey Echo. OK, we're tired. Make sure we get to the right runway. Don't do anything stupid. For the second time in as many days, Randy's instruments are his only lifeline. All right, All right. I'm fast and high. Come on, Randy. Better than that. Damn it. There's an arrival. <laughs> They're now within a day of their final destination. I'm just glad to be out of the tight uh, quarters there and just trying to get loosened up. A little tired, but uh, it never stops, so. Declaration. Yes, my support. We've uh, pushed it too hard, too long already. Start talking seriously about uh, taking tomorrow off. Corey's silence is loud and clear. To him, a day off is just another delay, one his business can't afford. The Phenom 100 is sometimes called a mini airliner, an upscale ride with a computer at its core. And right now, that's the problem. It's three main computers that are missing a software update. So they're not talking. See if we can format that. I don't know how to do that. The solution? A simple download. For Carrie, not so simple. Uh, my wife is really good with computers, so I have been really lacking in my computer knowledge and learning because I just say, honey, make it work, and she does. I don't even have words to describe how this little thing here can ground a $4 million jet. All right, here it is. Let's see if, uh, if she likes it. A few minutes ago, the jet wouldn't boot up. Turns out the software update... Good, I think. Pause system test. OK. ...is the magic touch. She's healthy, Thanks, puppy. Yeah, man. <laughs> Who's your daddy? <laughs> you miss your daddy, didn't you? That is back. 
the Phenom and her crew of two are finally good to go. If you have uh, any religious belief, this is the time to talk to your Lord and say, <laughs> Here, Lord, please don't let me screw up. If I blow this flight, I'll have a real hard time getting any jet job in the US because the jet community is pretty small and my name will be mud out there. Carrie has manhandled prop planes for decades, but he's never flown a jet. Banks and ground, 777 Bravo Fox, right, ready to copy, Glenn. 777 Bravo Fox, right, you'll clear for time. And the Phenom 100 isn't just any jet. Take off, okay. 4067, get back. Pilots call it a flying computer. Carrie's more of a typewriter guy. It's a big jump. Zip up, let's go. Good man. If you are not a good pilot and someone asks me, is this guy a good pilot? I will tell them the truth. And you would be amazed how many careers or jobs that I had to end because of my honesty. He's probably got some high expectations because I talk a big game, got a lot of experience. So it's time to put up or shut up. And I hate shutting up. Kerry will have to hold his tongue for a good long time. The trip, Sydney, Australia, to Las Vegas, USA. A commercial airliner makes the run in under 17 hours. But the Phenom was built for shorter hauls, 2,200 kilometers at the most. So for this trip, it's globetrotting. Across the Australian outback, up over Indonesia, Asia, Russia, then dropping down into the United States. More than 19,000 kilometers and 14 stops in six days. We're taking this jet right to the edge. And when I say right to the edge, it's right to the edge. In the plane delivery business, a day off is as rare as a problem-free flight. But after days of demanding it, Randy's finally got his R&R. All right, thanks, man. This is awesome. Flying is inherently dangerous and it's difficult. But there comes a point where I've got to just put my foot down and make that call. This morning, I was pretty pissed that we weren't flying. I wanted to get the plane down there, but this is amazing. That's your yeah. Yeah. Look at that kid. Did you get that kid jumping off? Oh. Come on. Let's see it. Here we go. Nice. Yeah. Oh. Nice. Woo. <laughs> so these are the fish that will pull you down to the bottom, huh? Jeez, that thing is strong. Did you see how big that thing was? Oh, Randy, look at this one. Oh. <laughs> this is much better than being in a small, cramped cockpit with no food or water in 120 degrees. I'm glad you talked me into staying. This is amazing. And Randy made a good call by, by just relaxing for the day and, and turn around and look at this. When's the next time I'm going to be here? This is awesome. <laughs> but Corey and Randy are about to be reminded Awesome comes at a price. The next day is delivery day for the Beechcraft Bonanza. But Corey Benson and Randy McGee haven't even left the ground, and already they're in a holding pattern. Hey, dude, I need some cash to pay the handler and landing fee and all the customs. Man, we're running light. We got six, forty dollars after this. Dude, they just don't. None of these places take credit cards. It's crazy. Dude, we're not even halfway through the trip yet. Their 24-hour vacation has left Corey and Randy cash-strapped. What does this say? And most of the bank machines appear to be taking their own day off. I went through uh, eight machines and two banks, and I couldn't get any money out. I've got about 700 Brazil. So it's about 500 bucks right now. 
Corey and Randy need around $2,000 to cover the airport fees and fuel costs. If we can't get the money, uh, we're not going anywhere. An ocean away. The techno jet they call the Phenom is living up to the name. Get this up. The Phenom can climb as high as a commercial jet and reach speeds almost as fast. Yeah, you have to watch it, okay, when you put a, a departure stuff. Just make sure that it's properly sequenced. For a prop plane guy like Kerry McCauley, it's like being strapped into a guided missile. I'm kind of feeling like a dummy in this plane, you know? I'm, it's like a caveman trying to figure out the, the Concorde. Carrie and Marcio blast across the Australian outback, veering up toward Indonesia. Marcio, I'd, I'd like you to meet somebody. Okay. I'm a superstitious guy, but what I'd like you to meet is Hula Girl. I got her when I first started ferry flying and been with me ever since. It's my good luck charm. Hula Girl has more than luck going for her. What the hell is that? Uh, Corey, meet Hula Girl. She's a coconut-clad icebreaker. On a recent flight to Brazil, tension was brewing between Carrie and Corey. Pretty interesting there, buddy. Yeah, well, you gotta have somebody to talk to on the long flights. <laughs> One look at Hula Girl, the turbulence in the cockpit disappeared. Hopefully she'll bring us good luck on this leg. She's not alone. Yeah. Let me introduce you to my friend Jack. <laughs> Jack is not uh, really a superstition or anything like this. It's just uh, he's just covering my behind because his behind is full of instructions for me. So don't forget the permits. Don't forget the gear beams, the chalk, the hotel, the fuel key. Every time before I go, you know, I take a moment to just uh, grab Jack and say, Jack, what's up? That's awesome. <laughs> Thought I was the only crazy one. No, man, there are weird people everywhere, man. Carrie's a veteran pilot, but he's brand new to jets. And on this trip, it's not just the technology he's learning about. Stay tuned. <laughs> Marcio is also teaching them some new tricks for their stop in Indonesia. Indonesia really loves football, and uh, they're big fans of uh, Brazil for the soccer. And we do not have any handlers, any support, anybody there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wear my Brazilian soccer jersey. Maybe I can make some friends. Ah, it's Ronaldo! Oh, my God! <laughs> That's awesome! It's also a plan to save money at the next stop. Marcio's not paying for ground crew. He's counting on a yellow shirt and a lot of charm to get him what he needs. All right, so here's the story. Just you and I. So uh, we have one chance to make a good impression. You know, try to uh, let me do the talking, I would say. You know? This is Terminal Information for Samratulangi International. Hydro contact tower on 118, clear for the visual for 36, bro. Fuck that. All right, Indonesia. <laughs> so, uh, this should be it. I'm not just a pilot, uh, I'm a flight department. How are you? I'm Captain Lucchese, okay? Oh, we're going okay. We, 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 we came from the little jet, oh. so I need to file the flight plans. Uh, I'm a dispatcher, I'm a flight planner. I'm a hotel reservations, I'm a maintenance coordinator, I do everything. Huh. Your friend Ronaldo? Yeah, my friend Ronaldo. <laughs> oh, that's my friend. <laughs> yeah, my friend. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know my Ronaldo. <laughs> he gave he gave his shirt. The jersey works its magic with the flight planners and the fuel guys. Thank you very much. See you next time. Thank you. What, what do we have to do? Well, now yeah. I'm here. But at his final call where he's looking for an exit stamp. Immigration officials don't see a yellow T-shirt. They see a red flag. I'm worried about the permits. I'm worried about the paper. Well, we didn't show up with the actual paper copy of our 
permit, problem one. Problem two is these guys seem to really wanted us to hire a handler. So on the immigration side, what do we have to do now then to clear? My role, your problem like this, to investigation for you. Investigation? This is a bad place for a pilot. We call the airport authority. Mm -hmm. Do I need to hire a handler? They said no. The interrogation room of an Indonesian immigration department. Wait for the big boss, and he's going to be the one that decides what the appropriate punishment is for us. I mean, it could seriously be jail. When he opened a rule book, said, oh, this is bad news. It seems failing to bring proper paperwork and cheaping out on ground crew is a serious offense. I have to hire ground handling services. Uh, yeah, like this. But when the head honcho arrives, 620. It's nothing that a few greenbacks can't solve. Thank you so much, okay? We'll see you next time. Have a good dinner tonight, okay? Carrie and Marcio are free to go. There are two friends that always give me out of trouble. One is Ronaldo, the other one is Ben Franklin. <laughs> Halfway around the world. You got one to work. You got some? You got... Randy and Corey are saddled with big airport fees and empty wallets. I'm not the most patient person, and so these delays drive me nuts. OK, we just landed. It's a beautiful weather. But they just ran into a little luck, and his name is Joey. Oh, did you pay already the fee here? No. No? I feel Joey gets what Corey and Randy are up against. Over there is going to be like 400 miles, let's say three hours. Let's say three hours. Because he's one of them. He's also a ferry pilot from the States and has done this route a lot. We need money to get out of here. Uh, let's see how much I have, but I can help you out for sure. I can borrow you money. You'll give me now, later. I'll deposit my account in America or here. Do you have a reality? It's kind of like a fraternity because there's only a very select few of us that do it, that have the, the guts to do it. And so we respect that about each other and, and we'll do anything we can to help each other out. Thanks, buddy. Let's go. That took way too long. When we got here, we had nice, clear skies, and now all quadrants, we got building thunderstorms. If we don't get out of here soon, we're not going. Let's go. Corey and Randy are in the final stretch. It's 1,500 kilometers to the finish line. And like any other marathon, those last miles can be a killer. They keep to them. Look at that, man. Storm, 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 storm. Huge storm. You see that thing? I can't even estimate how many miles wide that thing is. Randy's an old hand at dodging storm clouds he can see. But electricity is invisible and travels for miles. That's the airport. Getting all those lightning strikes. This lightning scope detects electricity in the air, not picked up by regular radar. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And the picture is grim. We got about 17 lightning strikes right over the airport right now, so we just made it out. Here we go. In one, four, zero, two deviation due to weather, sir. You yeah, have left. Any left. deviation either. We don't want to get any air gear and high, stuff. And, uh, head in a one. This prop kicking with all this moisture in the air, we're just generating negative ionization right now. We're just asking to get hit. Though modern aircraft are mostly built to take it, lightning can still punch a plane out of the sky. It can damage the frame and wiring, shatter a windshield, or spark an explosion. One of the worst times I ever had in an airplane was in an airliner and we took a massive lightning strike, and we almost didn't make that. If this plane got hit, I guarantee we'd never make it down. For Carrie and Marcio, it's been smooth sailing. A whole lot of round, hey. Oh, no, a whole, whole lot of deep. 
they've put more than 7,000 kilometers behind them in three days and are now zeroing in on Russia. That part of Russia was the primary point of attacking the United States during the Cold War. Take a look at that, a supersonic one. Yeah, that's cool. You see the runways and you see the security. It brings you back in time. So, wow, this Cold War, this was not a joke. The runways left over from the Cold War aren't very funny either. An Airbus lurches down the tarmac. He's shaking like a little girl because the road is too bad. X-ray is so f***ed up that he cannot uh, exit fast enough. Are you ready for departure from Festival Charlie or Festival Mike? After a quick refuel, it's Carrie and Marcio's turn to taxi for takeoff. Takeoff, OK. It's like heading off-road. Oh, well, this taxiway is beat up. Been on smoother gravel roads. I do things differently in Mother Russia. It's just a, a stone about this big it hits your tire and whoop, flies right into your engine. You just got yourself a million-dollar bill. The runway rocks miss the engine. She's on GPS doing the departure. But they may have hit something else. Cabin. Hello? Cabin. Cabin. Oh. Cabin. Cabin. Oh. Cabin. 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 Stop the climb. Stop the climb right here. Moments after leaving a Russian runway. Autopilot. Level off. Carrie and Marcio are in a full-blown emergency. Uh, we lost pressurization. Autopilot. Okay, tell that we need to maintain altitude right now. Slow down. The jet is losing cabin pressure. Autopilot. They need to stop their climb to keep from losing consciousness. But there's an Airbus closing in fast, and the control tower wants them out of the way. Okay, November 777, Bravo Foxes, climb initially 9,100 meters. You are being followed by uh, Airbus 330, 10 miles behind. Just forget about him. Then. Right, fly the plane for me, please. Maintain altitude and fix the ship. Carrie's a prop pilot flying his first ever jet, and this is trial by fire. Uh, negative. We have a pressurization problem right now. We need to hold altitude for a minute. We'll advise. Uh, folks, what's the problem? Uh, we have a pressurization problem. I'll get back to you in just a minute. Slow, 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 slow. 200 knots, 200 knots, 200 knots. 200 knots. 200 knots. 200 knots. While Kerry controls the jet, Marcio tries to troubleshoot. Slow, down. Slow. What level do you need? 1,800 meters. Which oxygen mask on? Under pressure, Kerry's fallen back on his old skills, flying the plane by hand. Autopilot on. Autopilot on. Autopilot. Autopilot. The computerized plane is back on autopilot. Autopilot. But Carrie's got it on the wrong setting. He quickly corrects. Have it. Autopilot. But in the confusion, he Autopilot. loses track of his airspeed. Stall. Stall. Uh, stall. 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 Autopilot. Marcio has no choice but to take back the controls. He powers the plane out of the potentially deadly stall. Are you okay? Yeah. Pay attention, okay? What the hell was that? Oh, you forgot to look at its speed? It's I don't know. That's what happened. Oh, ah, yes. <laughs> okay, there you go. Easy does it. Easy does it, puppy. Easy. There we go. That's better. Easy. They screwed up. I've never flown anything like that before. I barely know how to shut the door on the thing, so I've got a little bit of catching up to do. For now, Marcio rides the cabin pressure by hand. Hey, coming to flaps three. Okay. Carrie takes over the landing. Very nice, very nice. If Marcio seems unfazed by all the drama, 
it's because he's pretty sure he knows what's causing the cabin pressure problem. Oh, I know what happened now. He'll soon know if he's right. In the southern hemisphere. Look at that water coming down on that. Road. Corey and Randy are navigating a minefield of thunderstorms above Brazil. This plane cannot handle anything that storm's going to dish out, so we want to give it a wide margin. Concentration of vultures on final approach. Vultures, vultures, vultures. Turn right. There you go. <laughs> you couldn't make this stuff up, man. <laughs> I'm serious, man. Freaking vultures, thunderstorms. <laughs> this trip's tossed a lot of bad stuff their way. They've flown bone tired and been tricked by nighttime illusions. They've had no place to land and been cleaned out of cash. In this racket, a game plan is just a suggestion. Cuiaba approach, uh, good afternoon, November 9-1, Whiskey Echo, 080. Five days and more than 6,000 kilometers after leaving Florida, their final destination of Cuiaba, Brazil, is in sight. Every time we turned around, our plans had to change. We did it! It was just non-stop action the whole way down. Whew. We finally made it. And the one person as happy as they are about that All right, right. Congratulations. is the Bonanza's owner. <laughs> the new owner's ecstatic about his airplane. All right. Happy new owner. She's all yours now. <laughs> He's excited and he's kind of giddy walking around his new airplane and getting to hand the keys to him. And it's just like a huge weight's been off my back. Uh, but I'm ready to do it again. Next time, we got to bring a ton more cash. On a concrete Russian slab, Carrie and Marcio have one temperamental jet and an even bigger problem. The Phenom 100 is cutting edge. The mechanics, not so much. I'm here in remotest Russia. And these guys are, all the aircraft are bailing wire and two by fours. I mean, they're built to last, they're tough, but they're not, uh, they're not flying computers. But Marcio knows his way around this fancy Phenom. He's flown several of them. And he has a theory about this one. I want to make sure there's not, no loose wire. Oh, it's right up here. See, it's right up here. This wire is connected to a sensor that automatically adjusts cabin pressure. So it might be bouncing so much that it's just uh, giving wrong signals to the computer. Marcio suspects the rough Russian runway shook it loose on takeoff. I'm not too concerned about it. On the taxiway in, you know, the message disappears, so. Also funny enough, a lot of the Russian-made airplanes, they have huge tires. And we're asking, why do they have huge tires? Now we know. Now we know. There's a, a sensor there for pressurization. But taxiway in Russia. So sensor. After briefing the mechanics, Marcio and Carrie turn their attention to their next and most dangerous destination, Russia's Far East. The weather. weather. Come on with the hero. And the Russian weather lady doesn't sugarcoat the situation. Uh -oh. One kilometer visibility, which is not much. Showers, snow, and rain. Okay, mist. mist. From the late autumn till the spring, late spring, it is bad. It is often, almost constantly bad.
in the world of fairy flying, playing the odds is part of the game. Well, we're going to give it a shot. Carrie and Marcio are taking a chance on the weather. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Visibility, one, zero kilometers. Broken, one, five, zero, zero. They're coming up. First 500 feet, autopilot. Right, this is a remote area. I bet nobody's been over a mess of this stuff for a really long time. The Phenom has now soared across 8,700 kilometers and is arcing into the Russian Far East. Weather report just took a big turn for the worse. It was, okay, last one we had was overcast at 200 meters. It's now went to overcast at 120 meters. It got pretty bad in 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes, huh? November 7, 7, 7, Bravo, Foster, overcast at uh, 90 meters. Now we're down to 90, which is 295 feet. It's pretty low. It's getting there. The airport they're headed to is now almost completely socked in. And the trend is up. We got about a we gotta go somewhere else. This is not gonna work. They veer to another airport. Then that's just great. It's just closed the airport. Nice. I don't know what to do, man. What do you think? Ah. Uh, I don't want to turn around. If we decide to go, should we go faster and get there before it gets any worse? It's back to plan A. Reroute to the original airport and hope the weather clears by the time they get there. Two hours later, they're closing in on their destination. There's a big mountain we don't want to hit. Look at the way that the clouds are separated by it. It's not just terrain that's trouble. And uh, arrival on November 2, Bravo Fox Charter. Can you please request uh, light, uh, full bright, light, full bright at the airport, please? Uh, light uh, in operation. Say, no light? No, no light. Doesn't help much, does it? No, oh, that's not good. Oh, There's not enough fuel to turn around. With night falling and lousy visibility, they've got to pick their way to the unlit airstrip. To make this first one count. They drop into the soup that hangs low over the runway. 777 Bravo Foxtrot, you appear to land surface wind 300 degrees, 6 meters. To the airport. Negative. November 777 Bravo Foxtrot, in the market. just 90 meters above the runway. I see some lights. Okay, I'm past the okay. light. Yep. The runway lights suddenly blast back to life. 160 feet over actual runway now. Got it, you're good. Are we gonna live today? I think so. Oh, the beer's gonna taste so good. Flap's coming to zero. November 777, Bravo, Foxtrot, on ground at 46, back track, runway 01. This would have been a real bitch without any lights. Can I start breathing now? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it! That <laughs> <laughs> uh, was the issue ever in doubt. Maybe a little. <laughs> But a flight's not over until the keys are in the hands of the owner. And that's in Las Vegas, more than 5,300 kilometers away. Next time on Dangerous Flights. We need you out here. Corey's chance to turn a fast buck turns to bad luck. And that trim is a little fucking Yes, yeah, it is. When an old plane comes with a full-blown attitude. We got things freezing up, we got nuts and bolts freezing up. And the guy who loves to fly by hand...
has his hands full. It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. I couldn't make this stuff up, man. Across distances they were never meant to fly. This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. The planes can be too much to handle. It's like a caveman trying to figure out the Concorde. The pilot's too exhausted to fly at night. All you can see is black. There's no horizon. There's nothing. There's a lot of pilots that have died just because of that. But as long as there's money and fuel to burn, are we gonna live today? I think so. Yeah, They'll live to fly another day. On the last leg of a 19,000 kilometer marathon, two ferry pilots race to the finish line in a state-of-the-art Phenom jet. See Vegas. Fly. The airport right there? Uh, I have the airport. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Marcio Lucchese has flown plenty of these babies, but this is the first jet flight for Kerry McCauley, and he'll be landing it in front of the new owner. Dude, land there, land there. Autopilot. Start putting your flaps, start slowing down. If you're shelling out three and a half million bucks on an executive jet, you want it handled with kid gloves. Figuring, full flaps, no warning lights. Sink rate, pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Sink rate. Here you go, just a little. Uh, beautiful. A little bit of power now. All right, don't dive now. Just keep it, keep it. Nose up, nose up. Nose up. Perfect, my friend. Perfect. Well, that's my boy. And start breaking. More breaking. More breaking. Bam, 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 bam. Great thing, guys. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations with the new airplane. Thank you. It was a pleasure, huh? Hey, you guys we did a great job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. You. Thanks a lot. If anyone deserves to celebrate right now, it's Carrie. Oh, it tastes good after a long flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This trip, flying halfway around the globe, from Australia to America, was his trial by fire. Cabin. 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 Learning to take Cabin. orders from a computer. Stall, stall. And trying to hold it together when everything's falling apart. Kerry did really well. I was not expecting for him to pick up as quick as he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man, looking forward to do it again. Yeah, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but uh, you can teach an old pilot how to fly a jet, apparently. Kerry might have plans to cool his heels in Vegas, but he won't get the chance. Yeah, it seems to be a nice plane. I haven't seen it myself, but the broker told me it's nice. Back at head office, boss Corey Benson just landed a big contract to deliver a plane to Argentina. And he wants Kerry on it right away. This is Kerry. Hey, Kerry, it's Corey Benson, CB Aviation. How are you? I've got a, a trip that just came up extremely quickly. I need you to captain a, a Navajo down to Argentina. Yeah, sure, no problem. There was another ferry company that was doing the flight, and they uh, quit halfway through. So the client called me in a panic and is begging for us to do it. This is a chance for Corey to grow his new business and to succeed where others have failed. I had no idea how I was going to put it all together, but in this business, you got to be able to make things happen. The rush is on. Best case scenario for me is I don't hear from them. The plane takes off, they handle any issues that comes up, and I get a phone call that the airplane's delivered in Argentina. The plane is a 79 Piper Navajo Chieftain, a stretch limo version of the regular Navajo with souped up engines. Carries back in his element with the kind of plane he's flown for 20 years. Check the oil, oil capsule. All secure. 11 in the right and then uh, 10 and a half in the left. His co-pilot on Corey's rush job is Stu Sprung, a guy he's flown with once before. This opportunity came up very last second, but I was able to free myself up and get here um, in a day's notice, essentially. Stu's a far less experienced pilot with a fraction of the flying time Carrie's got under his belt. Just about all set? Yep. 
So on this flight, there's no question who's in the driver's seat. I've been chosen to be captain or however you want to want to put that. So, you know, we're going to we're going to be working as a team on this. Every, you know, all the decisions will be basically mutual. But if push comes to shove and someone needs to make a decision, I guess that'll kind of fall to me. All right. Let's get out of here. All right, 360, 2-2, clear for takeoff, 6 right. We get gas on the main. We got an undercarriage. We got a mixture. We got props. Do you want to take off? Sure. Right away, Kerry gives Stu the chance to show his stuff. I will get the gear. A little heavy. Your nose down. Gear coming up. Nose down, nose down, nose down, nose down. OK, you got it? Yep, got Got the controls. They'll head first to the islands of Turks and Caicos, then fly another 8,000 kilometers south all the way down to Argentina. Roger. Roger, so much so more sexy down south. But as they approach Turks and Caicos, Kerry spots trouble. Boy, that gauge is kind of pegged. Yeah, your eyes not vibrating. I do not like that. No, I mean, we're not at an extreme power setting at all. The oil temperature gauge shows the right engine is running hot. The right engine always does burn a little hotter. Cylinder head is normal, and the oil temp is super hot. It's just not making any sense. Still, it makes me nervous. I don't like a needle touching the red line. If it's not that gauge, we could cook this engine in a heartbeat. If the engine is overheating, it could set the whole plane on fire. I want to get this thing on the ground. Yeah. I don't want to screw around. That gauge is making me really nervous. In Florida, Two of Corey's other hired guns are heading out on a new mission. It's an old beast. It's an old POS. Corey's putting them in an old beater and asking them to fly halfway around the world. How about these blades? It was a little chunky. Captain Pete Zaccanino is a test pilot, a guy who lives to fly. I love designing airplanes. I love flight testing airplanes. I love flying airplanes. I love working on airplanes. I don't think there's a better career in the world. This is one job that might change his mind. Yeah, the DA's boots are pretty chapped up here. Look at this stuff. It's old. Welcome to the 70s, baby. Check it out. Oh, daddy. You were not exaggerating. Oh, dude, from here I can see those avionics. Good junk. Good junk. <laughs> Probably half the LEDs are burnt out on yeah. Who knows? This 32-year-old Piper Cheyenne has been sitting in the hangar for many months. Pete's counting on his buddy Brad White to help him out on what will be a long, tough flight. We got an old Junker airplane. We're crossing a huge amount of distance in a plane that hasn't been flown for months and months. And we're going to be uh, going through some totally hairy weather. They have to fly the old bird from Florida to the Philippines crossing the wilds of Alaska and northern Russia before making a final push over open ocean to Manila. No way are these guys starting their trip without a serious test flight. All right, you ready? I'm ready. I want to find problems during the test flight. That way I can get them fixed here, good maintenance shop. I just don't want the problems to happen in the most remote place in the planet. OK, everything is green, engines look good, fuel flow is normal. When I show up to a new plane I haven't met before, it's me bonding with the airplane. It's that airplane proving that it's not going to kill me. There's 1,200. Approaching. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, that trim is a little funky. Yes, it is. Trim controls small flaps on the tail that are crucial for climbing and descending. And the, man, that is weird. And this trim is barely working. Try getting yours trimmed up. Yeah, it's sluggish. Yeah, that could be a showstopper if we did lose trim and controllability. That would totally suck. Yeah. A plane's trim can make the difference between life and death. If the trim tap fails, that's a serious, serious situation. The aircraft could end up nose up vertical, nose down vertical, 
or upside down. All very hazardous scenarios. Pete and Brad cut their test flight short. I'll just start down. I'll just do it. As the Cheyenne comes in for a landing, the trim decides to behave. Three green, no red, full flaps are clear to land. All righty. But not many aviators grow old flying unreliable equipment. Well, we got a major trim problem. Yeah. So until the problem's fixed, this old bird is grounded. Twenty-seven hundred meters over Turks and Caicos. From you up the field inside. Negative, negative. Yeah, there's a the problem. The oil gauge is telling Carrie and Stu they have an overheating engine, so they're trying to land the Navajo as soon as they can. Seat belts, fuel pumps, air coming down. Ah, oh, man, gotta be kidding me. They're on final approach, but Carrie's not seeing the three green lights that indicate the landing gear is down and locked in position. Come on, give me a green. We only have two lights. Ah, son of a Dang it, dang it, dang it. All right. Now they're in double trouble. Cycle it again? Yeah, hang on. Double power, uh, 6 eight. We've got uh, only two gear lights. We're going to do a 360 and we our gear. OK, uh, confirm you're going to do a 360. That's perfect. By jogging the wheels up and down, they're hoping the gear will snap and lock into place. There's zero three. All right, uh, thank you. Come on, baby. Papa needs three green. On two. To start up the Negative. Oh, wait. We got it. You had it twisted. Looks like it was just a loose dimmer switch. <laughs> OK, turbo power, power, six four. We got three green. OK, three green. Two, seven, six, two, eight. You fit a land one, we one, two. We are clear to land. One problem solved. Now they just have to get the Navajo safely on the ground. Yeah. Well, I am really happy that uh, we have three actual wheels beneath us. Crashing is not good. Curry, helicopter 6606. All right, leg one in the can. While the plane's being refueled, they investigate. Let's take a look at that engine. Yeah. Oh, I'll record what these guys get on the fuel, too. Yeah. Well, we're going to see how much oil we got in this girl. See if that was possibly the problem. If the oil's low, yeah. it would mean the engine really was overheating. Well, I'm kind of liking what I'm seeing. I mean, it looks like got about 10 quarts. I don't know. We can put a couple in but she's really not burning any oil. I don't see any obvious signs of uh, overheating on the engine. You know, no, the cowling isn't discolored from overheating. The worst case is that there's a bad sensor and we can't see what the oil temperature is. And, you know, it's a judgment call from here. As near as I can tell, we're still good to go. They're feeling optimistic until they realize how much fuel they used up on this first leg. One, two, Three, four hundred. One, two, three. And there's five hundred. You can keep the rest. I'm not liking the fuel burn. That burned a lot more gas than I thought we were gonna. We, it was just over three hours here, and we only have forty gallons left, and we were not running super hard. They push on from Turks and Caicos to the Dominican Republic, and on to Aruba. There. Carrie does some new fuel range calculations. We've got to do a little checking. And Stu calls Corey to keep him in the loop. Our fuel burn, um, even at most lean, is way off on this thing. So we have to look at our legs again because our range is shorter. So it's, uh, it's not, not exactly the performer that we were hoping it would be. Let me know how it goes. Um, have a safe flight. Now their trip will take longer. So Carrie's keen to keep moving today. I'd like to uh, file our flight plan to Trinidad. When you want to leave? Uh, we're leaving soon, right now. Right yeah. now, right away. Right 
Trade Out is closed. You mean it's closed? It's an official holiday, so you can't leave today. That's crazy. Uh, all right, well, frustration level's running really high. As a ferry pilot, I love to put a lot of miles behind me every day. Um, I just, you know, 1,500, 2,000 miles a day, that's kind of standard. They've flown less than half of that, and with nowhere to go, the day is suddenly over. Back up in Florida, Pete and Brad are even worse off. Stuck at zero altitude and zero speed with a trim control they don't trust. I'm eager to hear if we need parts for the plane. Yep. They're stuck with this Piper Cheyenne, an old bird in desperate need of a good mechanic. I do not see anything binding or slipping in the actual mechanical control wheel. You don't see that play where you gotta you gotta roll it an inch or two before it starts. Yeah, but to that's you. normal in some airplanes, especially when you have that electric trim. All right, yeah, I've never seen that before. If you, it's not very common. Yeah. Flown a lot of different airplanes, never seen a loose one like that. Well, so. I think that's normal for you to have a little play in your trim wheel. The maintenance manual says it's good. You're airworthy. Gabe, the mechanic, thinks the trim is working fine. But he's not the one who'll be flying the plane 7,000 meters up in the air. Mechanics have killed plenty of aircraft and their crew and passengers because they've made mistakes. The mechanics are humans, and they make errors, just like pilots. There's some old going on in here. I just wanted to get a look at this system. It's old, it's beat up, and um... Who knows what's going what's to gonna surface today, tomorrow, halfway around the world. Like it or not, their departure is set for 6 AM tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with this plane, is getting it to the Philippines. Yeah, I appreciate the help. But as soon as they settle in to catch up on some calls, they get an urgent message from Gabe, the mechanic. I see him. I see uh, what I think I see. I see two puddles of liquid that is certainly not hydraulic. That is absolutely yeah. jet A. Game, I talk do. to us. Yeah. Hey, no. how you doing? Uh, this doesn't look uh, good, buddy. No, no, it's not good at all, actually. To be honest, uh, the issue we're having now is we've topped off your, your left and right fuel tanks. Yeah tips and as well as the nacelle tanks. And this is your nacelle tank back here right, 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 behind right, right, the here. engine. And uh, what I see now is you have a leak coming, a fuel leak. I see it. Coming from your left-hand nacelle tank. I see it. And it's running down a wire bundle. Oh, that's great. That's horrible. It's unbelievable. The fuel's running down this wing pan right here, and it's coming into these drain holes in the bottom of the fuselage. Dude, that's a huge fire hazard. Huge fire hazard. It's coming down. Holy horse What's the fix for this? Our best bet, actually, is to get a professional in here. Fuel tank expert. Most pilots are pretty good with a wrench, but when it comes to fuel problems, even the best like to delegate. If the expert comes in tonight and discovers that we have a bad fuel tank, this trip is not happening. Let's see what you got. So it should be back here, huh? A Gabriel, he's going to blow some compressed air in there, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start looking around and see if I can see where this air is escaping from. Hold on, I just saw something right there. OK, that tells me That's something. That's money right there. Right? See, see the bubble? It's an old and reliable trick. Blow in some air and let the bubbles give away the leak. The conduit right here is where the fuel's leaking, coming through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. see it. Lucky thing, Brad and Pete decided to fill up tonight instead of tomorrow. If we'd have fueled in the morning, we'd have put the fuel in, taken off, blasted off on our way, and been sitting on, gee, why are we using up so much fuel at the very least? And in the worst case scenario, an onboard fire. My confidence in this plane, every time it comes up two or three notches, it gets dropped down like five. At last, the fuel expert comes back with the verdict on the leak repair. A little good news and some bad news. Bad news. Yeah. That's usually how it goes. Yeah, well, it's aviation for you in the middle of the night. Um, we got a nut plate, which is going to be relatively easy to fix. And then we have a uh, probe. It looks like it's cracked. We'll have to get a new one and, you know, really can't do much with parts right now until tomorrow morning. So you're saying anywhere from a couple hours delay 
to maybe a full day. I would be willing to bet you're probably looking at leaving the following day. It's the same story every time. It's not your fault, you know? Just this gets so old. Next morning, Pete and Brad head back to the hangar, hoping for good news on the parts. Let's see if we can find Gabe. What's up, Gabe? Hey, what's Brad. Shaking, hey, good morning. What's, what's the deal with this guy? The good news is we did find a fuel probe in Florida. Ah, very cool. The bad news, unfortunately, is it's in northern Florida, and it won't be able to be here till tomorrow morning, guys. Are you serious? That's not going to work. We, we need to get something. I mean, that's a day and a half behind. But we got to figure out a solution, because this is getting ridiculous. The best ferry pilots will do almost anything to keep flying, even if it means renting a plane and picking up the part themselves in northern Florida. Yeah, hi. I'm wondering if you guys have some aircraft rentals. Is that the best you can do? That's pretty steep. That would be huge. Pete has just caught a lucky break. What's up, man? OK, I called my buddy. He said, no, nah, don't worry about that. I'll fly over there to their airport, pick up the part, just have it ready, give me the details. So it down to you guys, have it here tonight. That's huge. It is huge. Yeah, Jim's really hooking us up. All he wants is fuel. Pay for the fuel. Don't worry about aircraft cost. On his way. You know, aviation is a really small world, and uh, Pete's pretty big in that small world, so it's not surprising that, he got, that he's got people like that that'll help him out. Three hours later, Pete's pal shows up with the missing part. Hey, Jim. Hey, Pete, it's you again. Hey, yeah, you made it. Awesome. There you go, buddy. Thank nice. you, sir. He really saved us, and that's a huge deal. Thanks. Just the girls in the... <laughs> <laughs> Safe flight. We'll see you later. Check Long it out, time. dude. Now you guys have to work your magic. We need that in tonight, test it, filled with fuel, and make sure it's good. Looks like you guys will be getting out of here on time tomorrow. Yes. yes. Down in South America, Carrie knows that the next leg of their flight can be deadly. If we get to the point of no return and we're screwed, you know, we're going to be looking for options. It's almost 1,000 kilometers from Georgetown, Guyana, over nonstop Amazon jungle to Macapá, Brazil. This is the long one, kind of the dangerous one, because there's no airports in between, nowhere to go. If we have a problem, when we're out of range of coming of either airport from going down in the Amazon. Y'all set, Stu? Let's do it. Then we get to test our survival skills. They'll be pushing the absolute limit of the fuel range for the Navajo. It's already burning more than it should. 30 gallons an hour will give us maybe 45 minute reserve today, which is not even close to what I would like to have. If we have an engine problem and we have to dodge thunderstorms, we're going to be in trouble. So we're really just kind of crossing our fingers on this one and going for it. 85 coming up. I'll take the gear. Gear up. We got some time to make up. We do. An airport holiday yesterday in Trinidad put them behind schedule. That's why they're gunning it today. This thing is uh, turbocharged. It goes a little faster, and we get just a little bit more range the higher we go. So you know, let's see what that does. I say we just do it. Hang on a couple bumps. Woo! Boy. There we go. <laughs> the weather isn't doing them any favors. These headwinds get any worse, we're screwed. That is slow. We got to be pushing a 35 mile headwind. They're slowing down and using a lot more fuel than they'd planned. That's not good. Keep an eye on that fuel pressure, because you know if that thing sputters while we're on approach, we got to we got to go to those boost pumps right away. Okay. 36.6 miles. Come on, baby. Now the engines are sucking in the tank's reserves. I'm putting my shoulder harness on now. <sighs> Probably not a bad idea. At least one of the engines should still be running by the time we get there, but they're running pretty low, so I really hope we make it. Oh, there we go. There's... That's one engine sputtering. These pumps on. We have fuel pressure. They managed to pump just enough fuel to the engine to keep it going. 
My copy control, November 27608. Uh, like priority landing, uh, fuel critical. 23 miles from a copy. Right ox tank's dead. Now we're on the right main tank, and that one doesn't have much gas in it either, so. Kerry knows he has to nail the landing, because this time, there's no second chance. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, pre-landing checklist. Gas, not much on the fullest tanks. Undercarriage, down, three green, one in the window. Fuel pump's on. Mixture's full rich, fuel pump's on. Just a little bit more. So I think we're high enough to glide in there now. If we lose an engine. Yeah, if this quits now, I'm aiming right for the end of the runway. Coming full flaps. I think I got the runway made. Oh man. Yes. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Nice, 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 nice. Flaps, not the gear, the flaps, boost pumps off. Back on the ground. Safe and sound. It's been a while since I've been this happy for my feet on the ground. Yeah, no doubt. A little, uh, let's see, buzz check. Not too bad, not too bad. That was intense, but you know, the fact is we have two more, possibly two more legs left today, and got to have a clear head to do it, so we need to reset and, um, and try to get back in the air as soon as possible. Stu and Carrie are still 4,000 kilometers from their delivery target in Argentina, with only three days to go. All right. Corey made some promises to the new owners, and he's really counting on me to get it done and keep his promise for him. This plane needs to get down there fast. 4,000 kilometers north, all right, you ready? I'm ready. The Cheyenne's fuel leak has been repaired. So Pete and Brad are finally taking off. Departing runway five, there's caution for birds on us in the airport. They have a giant marathon ahead of them, 16,000 kilometers, from the sandy beaches of Florida all the way to the Philippine jungles. Yes, the redoodle. Next stop's only eight hours away. Today, they'll fly 3,300 kilometers and stop in Utah to refuel. At least, that was the plan. Because now, the Cheyenne is showing her age all over again. Got ice all over this windscreen, and it sucks. I can't see anything. Nothing. No heater. See the heater? Nothing. There's no heater. Up at 7,000 meters, the temperature outside drops to negative 30 degrees Celsius, and that cold is seeping into the cabin. We got things freezing up. We got nuts and bolts freezing up. We got a windshield that won't defrost. This is one thing after another. Let me start making a list, dude, because this is crap. Here, why don't we start here with the LEDs you said are burnt out? OK, LEDs. I'm going to put heater slash defrost, because. Yeah, the defrost. We have a multitude of avionics problems going on up here. Yes. Things that are in-op, they're not labeled in-op. Prop the ice. I wonder if I should even go there. Not now. Please don't do it. <laughs> if the de-icers don't de-ice the props, flying across Alaska and northern Russia will be a game of airborne Russian roulette because the icy conditions can shoot them down almost anywhere. I have zero confidence in this aircraft right now. No. Yeah. I will not fly this at night. I will not fly this in the weather. I will not fly this into ice right now, period. I'm pretty much on board with that. As soon as this plane touches down, she's headed straight back to the hangar. With just one-fifth of the journey behind her and 13,000 kilometers to go. In Brazil, Carrie and Stu are down to a tight two-day deadline to deliver the Navajo to Argentina. But Stu's just met a guy who can help them big time. From Macapá to Foz, in Brazil, uh -huh. going this way, 1,601. The, one, the direct was 15? Yeah, 15 something. something, yeah. Jonas is a Brazilian ferry pilot who's also delivering a plane to Argentina. 
1,545. That's three legs. Correct. That's you three legs. 500 each. He knows the back routes well, and he's offering to fly them over some shortcuts that'll save them a huge whack of time. We really uh, scored. Having a native to escort you is unbelievably lucky. So that's why I really love ferry flying. I love going to the small airports and meeting all the, all the pilots. You know, I don't like going to big international airports and meeting bureaucrats. That's just painful. It's like getting a root canal. Being able to fly to smaller airports, just get fuel, no flight plan, be on our way. It's huge. It's the biggest scoop of this whole trip. Oh, there he is. Just about 2,500. All right, we got you. See him? Oh, yeah, I got him. All right, we got you. Thanks. And you got the next airport on, uh, on the GPS? From Macapá, Jonas will take them to a tiny airport in Araguana, way off the beaten path. It's much more direct than the route Carrie and Stu had planned. The other frequency now is one, two, three, four, five. That's the frequency for the airport? Yeah, that's the frequency for all uncontrolled airports. Eruko, I mean, I never thought I'd make it here. Never knew it existed. There you go, beautiful. Turn and burn in and out. Not a bureaucrat in sight. The fastest stop of the entire trip, uh, it's amazing. For the first time since Stu and Carrie hit the clouds, they've got a decent chance of making good on Corey's promise to deliver this Navajo to its owner on time. Now all they have to do is keep up with their new friend. For nine hours, Pete and Brad have pushed this limping Cheyenne across the Midwest. Holy cow, my feet are, I think, frozen to the floor. And that's with a, a newspaper insulator. And yeah, that floor is colder, because I, I don't have the sun here now either. Just add it to the list of the other stuff that uh, the mechanics got to look at when we get to Utah. Their Utah pit stop is home base for boss Corey Benson. They can't wait to unload on him. I'm looking forward to passing him the keys and saying, all right, we made it this far, it's yours. Good luck, sucker. Good luck, sucker. Now you can see what you gave us to drive halfway around the world. Corey's waiting when they land. You made it. Knowing he's about to get an earful. Oh, we made it. How's the flight in? It's got all kinds of weird, weird quirks. There's problems with the avionics, the autopilot. There's no heat in it, so we're frozen. Well, I'm frozen right the now. The right windshield just turns to a sheet of ice. Pete's sitting there scraping it the whole flight. Is that on new issues after the test flight? Yeah. It's, it's old and tired. Corey has to get this delivery back on track. His pilots get paid, even for down days. It all comes out of Corey's $25,000 fee. It just barely got off the ground and, and hasn't even made it halfway across the country yet. We're already experiencing some major issues. It's got me a little nervous. With the help of Jonas, the Brazilian ferry pilot, Stu and Carrie have crossed this country in record time. And to their surprise, that means the Navajo flight is now ahead of schedule. Yeah, we just landed down here in the Brazilian border at Fao, what is it? Uh, Fazi Guzul. Fazi, Fazi Guzul. Only three hours from delivery, they need Corey to confirm the drop-off point. Got refueled, and uh, we're just giving you a call to uh, see what our uh, what the latest Perfect. is. Perfect. Um, the day would like you to continue to a private airstrip in Rosario. There will not be customs at this airstrip. I'm um, going to the coordinates right now. To these guys, landing without clearing customs sounds dodgy. Do they have this covered with the government already, or are we, I mean, because that's an illegal 
landing. I understand where you're coming from, and I can answer that question for you. <laughs> it might be best if you guys give Franco a call directly. If you don't have any dilemma with your phone, what's your change is, please give me. Okay, guys, all right. Bye. Thank you very much. Yep, bye. Huh. That is, that sounds like the craziest thing that happened the entire trip. Entering a country without <laughs> clearing customs, well, I don't know what they call it in Argentina, but it's a felony in the United States. And as pilots, we definitely have to follow some very specific rules, especially if we want to stay pilots, for one, and not go to jail, too. They've pushed themselves to the limit the last six days. They're only 1,000 kilometers from the finish line, but they refuse to risk everything for Corey's client. I'm not going into that private strip, no matter what he says. It's just stupid. We'll, <laughs> we'll get busted. Nah. It doesn't take long for the owner to come up with a new game plan. I mean, we will try to take off earlier, but we still have to clear customs and immigration, yeah. pay landing fees, flight plan. Yeah, that's the idea, but I think it's the OK, that will work. Thank you, Finko. Bye-bye. He's gotten rid of the dirt strip behind his buddy's plantation or something, who knows what it was. So now we're going to the International Airport, we're getting customs, everything's great. So, very cool. Back on track. With a squeaky clean and legal landing all lined up, Stu and Carrie start off on the last leg of their trip. I will get the gear. Finish line, now just three hours away. Back up north in Utah. Brad and Corey are trying to sort out some of the problems with the Cheyenne. And we're going to double check that heater and all the de-icing stuff and make sure it works. Ice cold temperatures in the cockpit on the first leg of the trip could be an ominous warning of a more serious problem. Just seeing if it's going to heat up. If there's no heat hitting the propellers or wings, even the thinnest layer of ice can alter the aerodynamics. Nothing on this, Brad. Enough to turn the Cheyenne into a kamikaze dive bomber. Well, we've got some pretty major issues. Um, I'm going to have to call the owner. He's going to be super frustrated. But these are just out of our control. Part of the challenge of ferry flying, especially older planes like this, if something can break, it will break. Hello, Edwin. It's Corey Benson with CB Aviation. How are you? We've got some pretty major problems with the airplane. It's just absolutely not safe for these guys to continue on um, how it is. For now, the Cheyenne is Corey's problem. We'll get you briefed on the safety, the seat belts. Corey isn't the only one based in Utah. Parachute. Pete lives here too. And so does his personal training jet, the Aero L39 Albatross. A couple things, throttle. You know what that is. Fuel on and off. Don't touch that, please. OK. This jettisons the canopy. We pull that handle all the way down. Canopy will just fly away. Grab the handle and release it, and the parachute will open. Handle. That one, that one forward. Boom. Upside down, we're out. Yep. I'm totally pumped. I'm not sure what to expect, but uh, you know, the plane looks awesome. Brad's flown a few jets but he's never been taught what to do when that jet's out of control in the wrong position. This is super important training. Every pilot should do it. It just teaches you how to recover an airplane if it's upside down, if it's nose straight up, nose straight down. It kills a lot of pilots. Here we go, huh? The view too. How much did you load it up there when you pitched up to 45? Uh, about three feet. That was awesome, dude. Okay, you got the aircraft? I've got it. Okay, full in or on left or right. Oh, sorry. That's okay, that's all right. Sweet, roll it out level. Isn't that cool? Woohoo! <laughs> I'm digging it. I'm rolling inverted. I'm gonna float it down to the horizon. That's about good. Now roll back. Dude, how cool is that? And that bitchin'? That's bitchin'. 
Yeah, that was awesome, dude. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yep. That's a good sign right there. <laughs> I could feel it when we were loading up a little negative. Yeah. Like when we were coming through, that's when I was just like, oh. <laughs> All right, I earned the hat then. <laughs> All right. Pretty sweet, wasn't it? That was sweet, man. Yeah. God, I can't believe how it flies. Yeah, it's cool. It's so easy. Yeah. Yeah, it that makes was awesome. it easy. Yep. It's been a great break from flying the Cheyenne. But by this time tomorrow, if Corey manages to get the heater working, these two pilots will be sky high back in the old bird again, where almost anything can happen. There'll be a ticker tape parade here. I want to see streamers, confetti guns. There it is, woo! -hoo. After three hours of smooth sailing, Stu and Carrie are about to make good on Corey's promise and deliver the Navajo on time. They've made it all the way from the United States, through South America, to Argentina, in only six days. Well, when, yeah, it takes up You're coming down. 110. Got it. Uh, 105. Got it. Oh. Touchdown! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Navajo to Rosario. After 9,000 kilometers in the air, pushing the Navajo to the limit, it's finally home. Hola, como esta? <laughs> we bien. We're here, us in the plane, we're here in one piece. It's good. Nice job, dude. All right, man. Killed good it. Trip. I'm feeling pretty good. It was a long and tough one, that's for darn sure, but it uh, feels good to get the plane in the owner's hands and turn your back on it, go home. Pete and Brad know this Cheyenne will never fly like yesterday's L-39 jet. But Corey and the mechanic did get the prop de-icers working. Hey, John, what's the word? Hey, Brad. Hey, Pete. We found that there was a couple of loose ground wires to okay. the uh, de-ice boots on the props. So we uh, tightened those up, did another test, and there they were. The safety problem is out of the way, but that's small comfort because the cabin is still cold as a beer cooler. We need the heater. It's way too cold. We got way too long to go, so. So we're doing a little troubleshooting here to try and figure out what in the system is not working. Hey, John, I'm feeling heat on the floor. Oh, yeah, the floor's getting warm. Yeah, it's, it's totally working fine. That's great news. That's totally good news. That's Man, it's news. pumping like crazy. It feels great. Yeah, that's a relief. The last thing on their list is the avionics, the electronic systems that control many of the aircraft's mechanical functions. With so many things breaking down, Pete and Brad have never had time to test them properly. Ready? I'm ready. But this time, they can't even get off the ground. Oh. I got a reverser lock light, and I have this flickering. This is really strange. We got that beta light flashing. It's a light that indicates the propellers are in the beta range, which is the reverse and uh, having the engine allow the propeller to go into reverse in flight is extremely hazardous. See if he answers it Sunday, and he doesn't know my number. This is Corey. Hey, Corey, it's Brad and Pete. How you doing? What's going on, boys? The plane is giving us an indication that there's something wrong with the beta on the left engine. The plan of action. John is on it right now. Corey's got the maintenance manual out and, and it's repeating the problem so it, it's not intermittent. Um, we'll just keep you updated. Okay, perfect. All right, see, see ya. You know what, I mean, I, this is no joke. I don't have three months to go <laughs> limping across the planet with this thing. <laughs> Next time on Dangerous Flights. I'm getting so Can bored. Can somebody tell me what the heck? Pete and Brad are running out of patience with the old bird. Technologically advanced aircraft. Oh, you're telling me is you'd like to be captain. Carrie and Stu battle for control of the captain's seat. Easy there, Hoss. Okay, easy to be. You're the one with the hand on the throttle. And bad weather is endangering both flights. You gonna be able to see anything, dude? I don't mind rain much at all, but lightning's bad. 
It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. Ooh, man, that is weird. Across distances they were never meant to fly. This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. Oh, there we go. This, pop -pop. this is the long one. If we have a problem, we're going down in the Amazon. Equipment breakdowns are the rule. We got an old junker airplane. Well, we got a major trip problem. Any flight can be a suicide mission. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. But as long as there's money and fuel to burn, <laughs> ay, 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 ay. they'll live to fly another day. Back on the ground, safe and sound. At a remote airport in Utah, two pilots are grounded and going nowhere for the third time this week. Well, I'm pissed, man. I'm getting so Can bored. somebody tell me what the heck? Every flight, we've got a problem. They just had to cancel another test flight of this Piper Cheyenne. One of its propellers was spinning backwards. That helps slow the plane down on landing. Well, obviously, we don't want something slowing the plane down when we're in flight. No amount of training can save the day on certain failures. And we have an unsafe propeller condition, period. It's a no-fly item. Pete Zaccanino knows what he's talking about. Gloves, helmet, oxygen. He's a test pilot who races high-performance jets for fun. If he thinks it's unsafe to fly this old plane to the Philippines, then he and co-pilot Brad White have a big problem. I can't even spit it out because I'm like, whatever. Yeah, this is when we start laughing. We went through anger, <laughs> frustration. Yeah. It's like the pissed it's off, and then you resolve yourself yeah, resolve. to re resolve yourself to humor. We're, we're, <laughs> we're totally. <laughs> it's no laughing matter for their boss. Corey Benson's arrived to check out the problem plane for himself. Hey, Brad, did you turn on these? Oh yeah. He's already losing money on this contract, and now he has to persuade the new owner in the Philippines to pay for all the repairs. This flight is, is probably the most dangerous and challenging flight out of all the ones that we've done. This plane continues to give us new obstacles. I mean, everything is breaking on this plane. The 32-year-old Cheyenne is what pilots call a hangar queen, a plane with low flight time, creaky parts, and leaky seals. Three failed test flights have proved what a lemon she really is. First, Brad couldn't get her nose up on takeoff. That could be a showstopper. Then she started leaking fuel. And it's coming into these drain holes in the bottom of the fuselage. Huge fire hazard. Then she just plain froze up. We got ice all over this windscreen and it sucks. I can't see anything. Nothing. I have zero confidence in this aircraft right now. Yeah. I will not fly this at night. I will not fly this in the weather. I will not fly this into ice right now, period. I'm pretty much on board with that. But icy weather is exactly what they're heading for. They fly north from Heber City to Alaska, then a frigid crossing to northern Russia before they cut south to the Philippines. The mechanic tackles the latest problem the mystery of the reversing propeller. Turns out the part that stops the propeller from spinning backwards is way past its best before date. This, this brush runs inside that channel right there. Yeah. The brush that's installed in here, which is part of activating the beta system, mm -hmm. is actually worn to 25 thousandths. And the most, uh, the maximum limit is 10 thousandths. So it's over twice the wear limit. Because if you would have been flying and burned, it went yeah. off, by the time you would have landed, it would have uh, yeah, up we would have pull off the entire propeller. We stopped and we saved this just in time. And it makes you wonder what else hasn't been checked on this thing. Across the Pacific, in Singapore, Corey has another plane to be delivered. Look at this place. <laughs> a high-tech, high-performance Cirrus SR-22. There it is. The first plane in the world to wear its own life-saving device as standard equipment. If the engine fails, 
the pilot can fire off a rocket-propelled parachute. It'll save the pilot, but the rocket usually totals the plane. So on this model, where does the parachute come out of? Physically fires out of the side of the aircraft. Pilot Stu Sprung knows this plane well. All the engine gauges are on the computer screen, so if you're unfamiliar with the avionics of this system, you couldn't effectively fly this plane. You wouldn't even be able to look at the engine gauges because there aren't any. But his partner, Kerry McCauley, has much more flying experience. On their earlier flights, Kerry was always captain, and Stu was his green co-pilot. It's heavy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got it, I got it, I got it. A little heavy. Your nose down. Yep. Gear coming up. Nose down, nose down, nose down. The question is, who will be captain on this trip? Well, I just assumed I'd be captain again. That's, I think that's, uh, that was the general assumption. Um, you have more experience than I do. You're not counts for something. But this is a technologically advanced aircraft. There's all kinds of weird um, little nuances with it, including the emergency procedures and the use of the parachute. So, so what you're telling me is you'd like to be captain on this, uh, this trip. Well, uh, you're the guy with all the, uh, the serious time. Well, uh, we'll give you, the, give you the reins on this one, see how you do. It's like, all right, you're the captain on this one. I'll be your second in command. You tell me what to do. Let's uh, see how you do as captain. But uh, I'll be able to handle it. I can take orders, sort of. Time to test fly the Cirrus and the new pecking order. Hold, hold here. Papa, hold here. You are clear for takeoff. Thank you. Oh, so far, so good. Nothing's uh, falling off the airplane that I can see. Well, everything seems to be working good on this thing. After 45 minutes of flying, air traffic control gets in touch. Papa, go up tower. Doing the uh, 160 Yankee ILS, is that not what we'll be doing? First round, cancel the approach. They're only allowed to fly for one hour. Then the military takes over the airspace. First round, cancel the approach. We're gonna hold on back. one second. Let me... Oh, dude, yeah. first round. Hold on one second. Let me just answer. We're 10 miles from BJR. Dude. First Please. round. If we don't get back in 20 minutes... We're gonna get back coming. Coming. We're there, all right? And tower from uh, 158 public call. If we don't get back on the ground in 20 minutes, that means we'll have to land someplace else and incur thousands of dollars in landing fees. Right now at this speed, we've got eight minutes to spare. Of the metal it is. And we're down to six minutes. It's gonna be close. Hope these guys don't screw around. In sight. Approach uh, 158 Popcorn, we have the airport in sight. Four minutes to spare. Looks like it's going to be tough for Carrie to give up control. And this will be one very long mission. From Singapore, the Cirrus will go literally halfway around the world to its destination in Ohio. 20,000 kilometers and 15 time zones. This is an epic journey. So which makes me just a little bit leery about letting Stu be captain. You know, I'm hoping he's going to make all the right choices. Hey, Corey, it's Kerry. Kerry, what's going on? We got the Cirrus all checked out. We'll be on our way tomorrow. I think that's great. You know, just work together and have a safe trip. Sounds good. I hope uh, being captain doesn't go to his head, but uh, I think he'll do all right. <laughs> just keep your hands off the controls when he's landing. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try my damnedest. Back in Utah, Brad and Pete are finally taking off on their flight to the Philippines, giving the old Cheyenne one more chance to fly right. Hey, we're on our way, and things are going well. Oh, aye, yeah, aye, yeah. aye. We are moving. That's beautiful. I have a positive feeling. Stay to the right half of the canyon. Briar. Standard mountain pass clearance issues. She seems to be running OK now. Little pat on the back, knuckle bump. Let's see if we can burn some miles here today. 
they'd better burn a whole lot of miles. Brad has another job as a contract pilot in Afghanistan, and he's due back there just 10 days from now. From Utah, they have to fly 2,200 kilometers today to get them up to Ketchikan, Alaska. Showing you 110. Okay, slowing. But on a pit stop for fuel in Washington State, bad news finds Pete. Hey, John, what'd you find when you got there? His brother tells him a blizzard just hit his home in New Jersey. One of your telephone poles were like just smashed everywhere. The power, the, the wires are strung between tree to tree to tree to tree. There's live wires on the ground? Yeah, it was truly spectacular. Oh, that's great. I mean, worse than the, the hurricane, it came out way worse. Do you think I need to be there? I think, I think it'd be a lot better if you were here than, you know, out running around. Um, and I know it's your job and all, but man, it's this one of those situations where if you were home, it'd be a lot easier to deal with. It's a tough choice for Pete. If he deserts the mission, he'll leave both his boss and his co-pilot in the lurch. All right, I'll call you in a little bit. All right, man. All right, John. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Here, select it up. Roger. The next day, Pete and Brad are leaving Washington State and heading due north to Ketchikan, Alaska. Where are we about? 320, 330? 307. Thanks. But Pete's distracted. He's decided to keep moving in spite of his wrecked property back home. And that means his brother has to deal with the damage. He called it Tree Armageddon. I said, that's terrific. Are you serious? Yeah, it's a nice property. It was, at least. He says, my property looks like a battle zone. Nice. So he's trying to manage it. If I have to, I'll go home from Anchorage. So you might actually pop smoke out of Anchorage and strand me with this thing. Cans of uh, direct help in November, November. Damn it. Tell him we got to go back to Bellingham. Why? We did not do EAPIS. APIS is a flight document that's essential for pilots who leave the U.S. for a foreign country. We gotta go back to uh, Bellingham. This could mean a $5,000 fine. 800 Echo Bravo, we'd like to return Bellingham. Are you declaring an emergency? That's a negative. No problems on board. 800 Echo Bravo, thank you. Pete turns back, but he's forgotten. They don't need the APIS because they're flying over Canada and landing in Alaska, a U.S. state. Damn it. Pete turns the plane around yet again. You all right, big dog? Nah, I'm not. I'm uh, pretty pissed off right now. By 1,200 now, Brad's cluing in. Pete's off his game. Pete's not the only one with thoughts elsewhere. The hangar queen is keeping Brad from the real queen in his life. His girlfriend Monica in Colombia, where he lives now. Como estas, baby? Bien, mi amor, y tú? Muy bien, pero tengo noticias es posible malas. ¿Qué pasó? Hay muchos problemas con el avión. Estamos como cuatro o cinco días tardando. No sé. Yo no puedo estar más tiempo sin ti. I miss you. Okay, baby. Yo a ti te amo y hablamos mañana, ¿ok? Okay. Bye, bye. Uh, I'm just talking to my girl back home in Colombia, and we're kind of, uh, I'm kind of breaking the bad news to her that uh, the plane's busted and we're totally behind schedule. And I have my own personal deadline. Brad's return to Afghanistan is coming up fast. I gave her a kiss on the cheek and was like, I'll see you in 10 days. And now it's starting to look like three months. So I'm getting pretty nervous about it. 12,000 kilometers away, Stu has piloted the Cirrus like a pro so far. Put the heading on it. The heading is 348. He and Kerry left Singapore this morning and now they're about to pit stop in Chiang Mai in northern Thailand. Chiang Mai, baby. 
They're headed for a few hours of R&R. &R. Hello. How are you? Here on the ground, Carrie gets to be captain again. Uh, we're going to go uh, take a tuk-tuk ride, see what we got going on. This is why I became a pilot. You go flying to places like this. This is so cool. This is awesome. Oh, that's cool. Oh, check this out. Are you hitting me right now? What oh, the hell are you eating? Oh, so this is food. You're eating these critters. Yeah, <laughs> good. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. What the? Yeah. <laughs> what the? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no. Nothing tastier than the guts of a giant water bug. 100 bucks, Stu. 100 bucks. <laughs> yeah. I'll pass. A lot of protein. Yeah. Peanut butter has a lot of protein, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Oh, no. It's like eating an artichoke. Where's the mayonnaise? But Boss Corey has a way of interrupting the fun. He calls them from 14 time zones away. Hello, this is Stu. Uh, we had an excellent first leg today. Tomorrow we've got a major issue with uh, trying to get the landing permission for your first stop in India. You guys are pretty much stuck to there's nothing we can do. <laughs> We're staying here for a full day. Oh, man. All right, well, thanks for the call. We appreciate it, and um, uh, we'll hope to talk to you soon. All right, guys. Have a safe flight. Thanks, Corey. Right, bye bye. It's not the first time Corey's had trouble dealing with a foreign bureaucracy. And guess who hates to wait? Pretty frustrated right now. I mean, we've got 13,000 miles to cover. I'm ready to go. I was, you know, we finally were, were moving and now we're stopped again, so. 1,300 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle, it's been raining all night. Pete and Brad are leaving Ketchikan, Alaska and heading further north to Anchorage. Oh, it's going to be more bumpy. We're going to be getting thrashed. Yeah, it's going to be bumpy. If it gets crazy, certainly help me out. Here's Pete at 90. There's 100. How's it right? Here up. The Hangar Queen is behaving. For 300 kilometers, all's well, or so they think. I'm going to start down. Do it, man. Let's get out of this junk. We've been in the clag all day. And you're climbing. I know. I don't get it. Brad tries to drop down, but the plane drives up. And the autopilot's off. And the damper's off. Yeah, I just kicked it off. Roll your trim for me, will you? Trim locks in a set of small flaps on the tail that make the plane climb or descend. Nothing. How about the other way? Try both ways. Nothing. I got nothing, too. Is it stuck? Feels it. I wonder if it's iced up. That's what I'm wondering, too. If the trim is frozen, dropping altitude for a landing is going to be a real fight. I'm trying to think if there's anything on there, if I'm doing something goofy that's blocking that trim. Let me find the trim breaker, too. All righty. There it is, and it's in. Is it in? Yeah. It's just stuck. They're only 20 minutes from Anchorage, and they have to land soon. That's fucked up, dude. So we potentially have our trim in op, just like we did before. Even on their first test flight in Florida, the trim was iffy. Yeah, that trim is a little funky. Yes, it is. But the mechanic disagreed. I think that's normal. Yeah, I've never seen that before. If you... The maintenance manual says it's good, you're airworthy. Now, Brad has to keep fighting the climbing Cheyenne. Yeah, what I need to do is sit and push on the stick. Right. If I let go, it's going to pop up. Bravo, ain't approach. 
You know what? It might be a smart move to pull this thing into a hangar and let it dry out overnight, too, because I'll tell you what, I don't want to be flying this thing and having uh, frozen windows and frozen trim, and we're just counting on them and thawing out when we come down. Now, that's dumb. Finally, Brad makes the plane descend enough to start their landing. Okay, I got the airport in sight. Roger. Cheyenne zero, I can probably clear visual approach, runway 32. And we got a crosswind of uh, 70 degrees at 15, gusting 22, and the runway is icy. Bravo, when able, reduce speed to 170. Hey, runway's in sight, lined up. Contact you can call my speeds for me. Yep, 120. I can see the trees whipping, so yep. just hang on there. Yep, 130. Okay, final flap. Selected, 120. 100. 95, 90. Boy, I can land a 747. Uh, you can. Nice job. The Cheyenne limps into the hangar yet again. That's a big puddle. Yeah, there's a lot of water, dude. They think the heavy rain from the storm in Ketchikan leaked into the plane and froze during the flight. Uh, I'm smiling about it, but I just can't believe there's another problem on this thing. Piece of We should probably leave that door open. It's late. Let's get something to eat and uh, make a plan and... All over it. Sound good? Yep. Cool. Later, at the local Bush Pilot Bar. Hey, guys, this is Pete. This is my old next-door neighbor. How you doing? Ken. Nice to meet you guys. And this is Luke Hickerson. Brad grew up here in Anchorage. All right. Well, to old friends and a few new friends. Yeah. Yay. Away from family and friends, ferry pilots depend on each other and breaks like this. Ooh. Damn it. But then Pete gets bad news from Boss Corey. Hey, you ready for this? They're saying they don't have our, the right paperwork for filing our flight plan into Russia. Who's in charge of that, Corey? Bureaucratic red tape is a constant hazard in the ferry flying biz. I don't need any more stress right now. I really don't. We've got the deadline of the plane. I've got my personal deadline. Pete's got his house destroyed. Our airplane is in horrible shape. It's just taken forever. Life on the road, not easy. 10,000 kilometers away, Stu and Carrie head to the airport. After a one-day delay in Thailand getting their paperwork sorted out, they made it all the way across India to Pakistan. It's kind of sometimes our only chance to get to see a whole country in the daylight, so we really soak it in. Yay! <laughs> yay, yay, yay! Today, they plan to fly across the Gulf of Oman to Al Fujairah in the United Arab Emirates. It's going to be kind of a risky flight because it's uh, it's almost 700 miles and almost entirely over water. We have to steer clear of Iran's airspace, so even if something was to go wrong and over the water, we would really have to make a decision whether it was better to ditch in the water or go land in Iran. Heading is 216. Goodbye, Karachi and Pakistan. Stu is still captain of the high-tech Cirrus. Karachi uh, approach, number 158, Papa Gulf with you, 7,000 feet. 700. 700. He's climbing. But he's lost his edge this morning. Seems Karachi has made a gut-wrenching impression on Stu. What did you eat last night that's killing you? Oh, no, we tried some uh, local uh, Pakistan cuisine. That was really good, but um, it was definitely off the grid for me. Kind of paid for it all night, and was hoping to get it kind of out of my system before we started flying. But right as we were getting ready to take off, I was like, oh my god, I, just, I need to get in that plane and get in the air, because if I don't, I ain't going to make it. Over the Gulf of Oman, Stu has nowhere to go and nowhere to land, because now they're in the real danger zone. Iran's airspace is about five miles that way. Those guys aren't too friendly. Oh, I'll tell you what, though. The way I feel right now, that was the closest bathroom. I'll take it. I don't know a worse situation than being in a small aircraft for five hours with Iran 
Next to you is the closest land without any bathroom with a severe stomach problem. It's the worst torture I can imagine. How you holding up there, boss? Four and a half hours of the most torturous flying I've ever had to do. Yeah, I suppose it was a real rocking day. It could be a little uh, more uncomfortable. You're gonna have buns of steel by the end here. Got the clench going. Hang in there, my brother. Hang in there. If Stu could fire off the Cirrus parachute without wrecking the plane, he'd be bailing out right now. I needed to be in a hospital. I was having the most severe stomach sickness that I've ever had in my whole life. The new captain's in no condition to land the plane. So Kerry gets what he's been waiting for, control. Why don't you just sit back and enjoy the ride, Captain Stu? Hold your I'm watching you. Hold your shit together. <laughs> Stay really still. This will be Carrie's first shot at landing the Cirrus. Well, flaps take a long time to slow down because the wings are so small. So you really got to start scrubbing speed early. He comes in way too fast. Stu reaches for the throttle. I got it, I got it. I got it. <laughs> got it. They're down, but Stu's agony isn't over. Easy, 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 easy. Okay, easy to be. You're the one with the hand on the throttle. All right, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Alfred Jr. Guess where Stu will be heading right now. Uh, and his troubles don't end at the airport. I hope the toilet is close to the bed. They're both 50. Oh, thank you so much. At the hotel, Stu finally crashes. Pakistan's revenge. Stay in touch. I'll give you a call later. And uh, if you're not up to flying tomorrow, no big deal. We can, we can chill here for a day or two, whatever it takes. Carrie may end up in the captain's seat on this trip after all. All right. Well, get some rest. We'll talk to you later. If he gets sick enough that he needs to go to the hospital, it's possible that I'll have to continue the flight on my own. I mean, the plane can't wait for forever, you know. This is a money-making operation for everybody involved. If he's down for the count, I'm going to have to take it myself. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm hurting. 10,000 kilometers northeast. The hangar queen, Cheyenne, has dried out overnight. Good thing, too, because she has to keep moving toward her final destination in the Philippines. But Brad's heart is no longer in this trip. Estamos acá en Alaska y ya salimos el norte de Alaska, pero estamos saliendo ya mismo. Te voy a extrañar muchísimo. Ah, yo a ti, baby. He wants to get home to see his girlfriend, Monica. But it's only six days now before he has to go back to Afghanistan. Bye, bye. I can't let my wanting to go home to her push me to make a bad decision, like, oh, yeah, you know, if we get that much further, that gets me that much closer to home. I can't, I can't let that affect me. Got to be smart. He's not the only one with thoughts elsewhere. Pete's still worrying about the fallen trees and hydro wires all over his property back home. I got to say, I don't like it when, when the Pete's not on his A game. Yeah, who does, right? I don't. It happens. Too many negative things going on. They both have to stay sharp on this leg. It'll take them to Nome, Alaska, over some of the most rugged, isolated country on the continent. That terrain there in a single-engine airplane, if you have an engine failure, the best thing to do is just pitch over and get it over with. Not me. I fight for everything. Do you? Yep. It's always a chance. Never know. Fight for your marriage? Whoa! You didn't go there. I'm sorry, Pete. <laughs> I'm sorry for slapping you down terribly. Uh, it's all right. I can manage it. Let's just add more stress to my life. The Cheyenne flies trouble-free for the first hour and a half. But that doesn't last. Okay, so look at your, look at, 
Look at what's happening. I'm watching it. You know what's happening? Yeah. You make that turn and yours takes off like a shot. And look, mine's barely moving. The plane's navigation systems have suddenly gone haywire. Right now, we're having massive problems with our gyros whenever we turn the airplane. I'm not sure how much we're turning. The bank has given us erroneous information. And I think we have a faulty computer. The instruments are doing goofy stuff, so we have to really be okay. on our game. I'm hand flying right now, and we're going to hand fly it all the way through these clouds. Flying visually could work, except they've just lost their windshield heater again. How come my side's fogging up? Because this plane is get to. This is exactly what happened to them on the first day of their trip. We got things freezing up. We got nuts and bolts freezing up. We got a windshield that won't defrost. I can't see anything. Nothing. Now, they're almost ready to land. They can't navigate by instrument, and they've almost lost visibility. I'm totally blind right now. That's terrific. I wonder if this is a dumb move to flip those wipers on. Uh, dumb. Pete has nothing but an iced up view of what's ahead. Are you gonna be able to see anything, dude? Only his instinct and experience will get them out of this one. And full flaps, please. Speed checks selected. Moving. Thank you. File checks complete. No landing clearance required. Roger. Give me a 500 for call to minimums. Roger. Internet Echo Bravo with Higgins, sir. Short final. They've made it, but their faith in the old plane has hit a new low. What a crock of Unbelievable. What a heap of garbage. I can't believe this, dude. More and more problems. It was lovely to be on the approach, and I couldn't see out my windscreen. Pete and Brad have a broken windshield heater and a long list of instrument problems that need to be fixed fast. In that scenario, that's how people die, is that scenario right there. Yep. If you passed out, I would have been unable to land. Yeah, it's just stupid. But at least we're broke here yeah. in the US. That would be insanity if we broke down in Russia. They need a mechanic who understands the plane's 32-year-old systems. But they're most likely out of luck here in Nome. We need to start briefing up Corey, seriously. This has to be fixed. Corey. Yeah, I don't just need avionics. We hopefully can find someone that knows this system. This. So we might have to pull somebody out of retirement or the nursing home that's old enough to have worked on this. But um, I don't know what else to do other than head back to Anchorage for proper repairs and hopefully find somebody there. All right. Well, do what you need to do. Good luck, guys. Okay, thanks. It's really going to extend this trip. They backtrack to Anchorage in search of a mechanic. Flying the Cheyenne is risky, but better over Alaska than the middle of the ocean. This appointment is one way to look at it. I look at it as a complete waste of time. Yep. We're going back to Anchorage. We're going backwards. We're going back. Back, 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 back. On the ground in Anchorage, the clock's running out, especially for Brad. I just got an email from my boss in Afghanistan, and I had begged and pleaded for some extra time. And they just said no, that I absolutely have to be back on the day as originally planned. So in a nutshell, my trip is over. So that's the end of the game. What's up, dude? Hey, did you get the weather printed out and all that? Yeah, I got everything. Cool. Uh, but I also got to talk to you about something. And I got an email from my boss. I asked for some more time because I knew this trip was jamming us up. I was told no way, and I got I to pop smoke. 
That's really bad news. I know, I hate to do it to you, but there's a, there's really nothing I can do. Tell it's, me it's after Russia. It's not after Russia, it's like I'm leaving tomorrow. This is gonna really, really, really suck. During yesterday's flight, a stomach bug hit Stu with a vengeance. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, hope we're making the right decision here. He's decided to push on with the trip today. So what's the longest you've gone? Or I should say, what's the longest you haven't gone so far? Maybe 15 minutes. So can you quintuple that? But he's having a tough time holding it together. I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Dude, you're killing me. Here goes nothing. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> oh, look at that place. Jeez. Whole different terrain, civilization, layout. Yeah, no doubt. So did you take any unusual precautions? I have full confidence I can get to Kuwait. Buns of steel. Stu's feeling better today. Ready for the 13,000 kilometers they still have to fly to get them to Ohio. He's the man with the expertise on the high-tech Cirrus. And Carrie can't resist teasing him about it. So you're not hand-flying this? Of course I was. I'm always hand-flying it. You see my hands on it. You autopilot boys. You don't get a good climb with autopilot. You gotta be smooth, man. You're fighting. Oh, I'm correcting you. Oh, whatever. Just like I had to correct your landing yesterday. Oh my god. Oh my god. They sail over the desert kingdoms like tourists. Wow, there it is. What is it, the world's tallest building? Oh, right there. Check that out. Unbelievable. But when they reach Kuwait, it's back to business. They buckle down for a 1,200 kilometer night flight across the desert to Jordan. Deserts usually promise clear skies, but not tonight. Here we are in the middle of the desert. What do we get? Freaking thunderstorm. This is the worst rain and uh, weather we've had yet. I don't mind rain. I don't mind rain much at all. But lightning bad. A direct lightning hit could fry the computer systems in the Cirrus. Or even worse. Man, only we can find thunderstorms in the desert. Ah, y sabes qué? Tengo buenas noticias para ti. Sí. Estoy saliendo a Alaska hoy y llego a Colombia mañana. <gasps> no. <laughs> qué rico. <laughs> sí. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow, okay? You'll come to the airport? Okay. Bye-bye. Brad is heading home to Colombia, leaving Pete to deal with the delivery of the Cheyenne. I feel bad for bailing on Pete, and I'm not even going to really have any time to see her. I got to leave right away for Afghanistan, but um, that's the life of a pilot. Brad's managed to change the life of another pilot as well. Into the breach comes Randy McGeehee. He had to hop on a plane last night and fly 3,600 kilometers north to take Brad's place. Yesterday, I was in sunny California. Uh, actually at the beach with my kids, and uh, now here I am in about, looks like about a foot and a half of snow, uh, about ready to cross into Russia at the worst time of year to, to fly over there. Hey, fellas. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you, Randy. Good to know you. Heard good things about you. Yeah, thanks. I'm looking forward to flying with you. Who do I have to thank for this lovely little vacation I get to go on here? A little piece of machinery called nice. Cheyenne 2. He's been a handful, lots of problems. You know when you go to the avionics shop and you see all these old radios and stuff, you think about the old days of flying, that's what that dash reminds me of. What a piece of crap, huh? Yeah, you gotta be on your toes. 
But the hangar queen isn't Brad's problem anymore. He's heading home to his girlfriend. They're stuck with the lemon Cheyenne. See you on the flip side. See you, bro. See you, man. Sick trip. Good to go later. Glad that asshole's gone. Yeah, jeez, <laughs> what a <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Two days later, after all the repairs, the Cheyenne is still acting up. This thing sucks. Yep, put it back into the barn. What is wrong with you, airplane? Pete and Randy have just come back from a failed test flight. The plane's still not ready for the next leg into Russia. If this airplane were really in service, it should not right. have this many issues. I know. And on top of all that, there's still a tree in the roof of my house. It's just great. While mechanics look under the hood, they plot the rest of their trip, but they get a nasty surprise. Listen to this. Gnome's being evacuated for the storm. <laughs> you shitting me, man. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> a massive storm has stopped everything cold. These things get named hurricanes down south and get a category. It's that magnitude. We have to have good weather for this plane, and we've got the storm of the century that we're dealing with instead. It looks like the storm will ground them for at least two days. And when it's over, their first airport in Russia will be closed. Military airport, it's not open on Saturdays or Sundays. <sighs> yep. You got to be kidding me, man. Nope, I'm not. And so what we're looking at right now is <sighs> we are dead in the water Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <sighs> Why am I here? Pete needs to go home to take care of his wrecked property. I got to really think about getting, getting on an airline and going south. Or it's not like we can do anything anyways, you know? Nope. Airplanes broke, weather's horrible. Weather's bad. Airport's closed. What are we going to do? The Cheyenne is already six days late for delivery. Now Pete and Randy have to leave it behind while the storm of the century bears down on Alaska. This is the ferry flight from hell. Ten thousand kilometers from Anchorage. Yeah, me no lucky the lightning. We had lightning. We got a history. Carrie and Stu are crossing the Arabian Desert from Kuwait to Amman in a lightning storm. So I got hit by lightning once. And I was reading my book, listening to my walk band, having a good thing. And boom! I just, holy sh It hit the prop, and it was really loud. It was a big Christmas tree and wreath of fire around the prop thing. You know, and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm a flying gas tank. I'm like, okay, why am I not dead? And like, everything's nice. still working, and the radios are still on, and holy sh <laughs> A lot more popping up here. It's kind of an even line, it's just a line of thunderstorms out in front of us. Stu tries to find an escape route away from the lightning. Oh, did you just go left? Just a little no, because I just saw one on the other side of it. Uh, no, I, I, would go, this I would go just, just to the right of it. No sense chasing him around. Let's wait till we get a little closer and see what we get. You couldn't be more vulnerable than to be flying at 8,000 feet, because one of those bolts of lightning can come through the aircraft and fry the avionics. Both pilots are really starting to regret their decision to make this desert leg tonight. It's almost like someone's trying to tell us something. Hey, you dummies. Next time on Dangerous Flights. It's too cold. I mean, we're minus 45 degrees at altitude here. Randy and Corey go into a Russian deep freeze. It's so hard to move right now. I'm a little worried and risk hypothermia. Holy sh My feet are numb and hurt. Easy, easy. You're, you're, down to, you're going down a 1,000 feet a minute. And Carrie totally loses it with Stu. Level the wings. Level up, level up. Hey, 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 get us, pull us up. All right, all right, all right. 1,000 feet over the water. It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small used aircraft. Oh, man, that is weird across distances they were never meant to fly. 
This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. Freaking thunderstorm! Every flight is a gamble. Everything is breaking on this plane. Patience. What a crock of And friendships. Dude, if we don't get back in 20 we're minutes, we're gonna get back coming. We're there. Are tested. But as long as there's money and fuel to burn. Who do I have to thank for this lovely little vacation I get to go on here? They'll live to fly another day. Piece of machinery called Cheyenne 2. Stu Sprung and Kerry McCauley are caught in the teeth of a desert storm. Now oh, there's kind of a real thin line in front of us. Like it completely crosses our path. An eye in front of us, make sure we don't have any surprises. Until now, they've been lucky. Five days ago, Stu and Kerry launched from Singapore in a 2008 Cirrus, a plane with its own backup chute. Aiming for Ohio, they crossed Thailand, India, and Pakistan. Nearly 5,600 kilometers, where the only severe turbulence was in Stu's stomach. I feel sorry for you, man, you know, dying up in here. But now, over the Middle East, they've been ambushed by weather. Isn't this supposed to be the dry part of the world? This is the first time we decide to do a 100% night leg, one of the longer ones of the trip. And here we are flying through a bedded thunderstorm. Got another one over there to the right. And right now, flying around this storm is not an option. We're right on the border of Iraq, and uh, pretty sure they won't be uh, super happy with us. <sighs> A detour over Iraq could be more lethal than a thunderhead. Civilian planes have been targeted by missiles before. I think we might be lucky and have a little hole right in front of us. Yeah, it, it kind of seems bit. that way. An opening appears in the wall of thunderheads, and they make for it. I'm liking this hole so far. So far, yeah. It's like threading a needle on a bumpy road in the dark. We can slide through this. Yeah, just get on the other side of this and we're gold. Your approach is approved, that MMI frequency for But as they come in to land, they've got one more problem. Each other. Where are you going? Oh, just give them, like, give them the thing a chance to do its thing. The approach should be more like that. Stu's racked up hundreds of hours on Cirrus aircraft. Look yeah, at this place. <laughs> so from the start of this trip... We'll give you the reins on this one, see how you do. They agreed. Stu would be captain. Your nose down. Gear coming up. On their previous missions, Carrie's experience made him the heavyweight. Nose down, nose down, nose down, nose down. And this role reversal has been a struggle. First round, cancel the approach. We gotta hold on one second. One second, let me answer. We're talking uh, round. Now, just seconds from landing, Carrie's turned into a backseat driver. You're not even close. Yeah, I know. I know. Stu trusts the autopilot to help bring them in. Ain't doing it. Carrie's a fly-by-hand guy who thinks autopilot is overrated. But a night landing at a strange airport is a bad time to start second-guessing. Ah, giving up yet. Stay a little high. Got a long runway. It doesn't look that long. That's way long. Stu hit down a little hard, but Carrie holds off on the color commentary. Park you next to this guy. Got it. For as long as he can. Around the globe, Stu and Carrie's boss, Corey Benson, has flown north to save a mission. I didn't expect to be up here in Alaska right now but we're, we're out of time. We need to get this plane down there. This Piper Cheyenne is 32 years old and showing her age. So if anything could go wrong, it has gone wrong on this flight. You know, it breaks down every time we fly it. That's no exaggeration. 
Right off the bat, a mechanical problem drove the plane nose down. Oh, uh, yeah, that trim is a little funky. Yes, it is. Then it started spewing fuel. And it's coming into these drain holes in the bottom of the fuselage. Huge fire hazard. A busted heater nearly froze the pilots out of the cockpit. We got ice all over this windscreen, and it sucks. After weeks of repairs, the first two pilots simply ran out of time and had to abandon the Cheyenne in Alaska. Now, Corey's stepping in to rescue the flight. Well, the plane's checking out all right. Hopefully, we're at the end of all the maintenance nightmares. With a plane as old and unreliable as this one, Corey trusts only one man in the captain's seat, veteran pilot Randy McGeehee, who's been with Corey since day one. This flight's going to be different than anything we've ever done before, especially this old avionics in here. I've never seen it before. What he can see is trouble. And the point is, is our workload is going to spike compared to what we're normally doing. Just little things like talking on the radio and putting frequencies in and dialing in our navs. It's going to be a lot more work than we're used to in the critical moments of flight. Are you nervous about the flight at all? I actually don't feel real good about it. I mean. As pilots, you know, you don't go, oh, I got a bad feeling, but this one's got me uneasy. I mean, that's, it's honest, you know? For Randy to say that this is not like any other flight, I mean, he's got well over 10,000 hours of flying. That definitely makes you think twice about this flight. I just hope that that's the end of all the bull with this plane. We need to get through Russia, and get it down to the Philippines. Don't count on it, buddy. Props are on feather, autopilot is off. All right, man, I'm pumped. Since Corey took on this notorious hangar queen, it's averaged a breakdown every 800 kilometers, even backtracking for repairs. Now, they're asking it to fly close to 9,000 kilometers in just five days. Dude, if we make it, it's going to be a miracle. After a few hours of shut-eye, Stu and Carrie are rolling out. Nothing like a good early noon start to your day. Yeah. Well, we get to bed at 2 o'clock, and it's, that's all we can do. What a cool departure. Holy moly. This is crazy. We're, we're flying over this desert that's so full of history. I mean, there's been so many battles waged across this area. Carrie and Stu have their own ongoing battle over who's really in charge. Go that way, go that way. And now, when it's as simple as snapping a few pictures over the Arabian desert. Over the train. I'm going, I'm going. Give me a second. Oh, you're not. Give me a second, dude. Give me a second. They can't even agree on how to sightsee. You're going to miss it all. Stop yelling at me! Now, close to the midpoint of their 20,000-kilometer journey, their route takes them across the Mediterranean into France. And a full-blown snowstorm. Going this way and it's coming at us fast. We can't outrun this thing. It's impossible. It's dumping snow outside, but luckily we're too high for anything to stick to the wings. Even now, the sparring match doesn't let up. Oh, see uh, about getting it from the center. Hey, set, pull, pull. Hang on, hang on, Nancy. I'll get your panties in a while. But the sparks inside the cockpit are no match for what's outside. Oh, man, are we getting pushed. Holy. The winds are now gale force. All the power, all the way down. 54 and on tailwind. But the storm has one more very big surprise. Oh, look at that. Feel that? Are you kidding me right now? Holy oh. f***. In a minute, went from nothing to, oh my god, hundreds of lightning strikes. That, I've never seen that before. Each of these dots tracks a lightning strike in their path. 
Oh, a minute ago, there was nothing there. And it just painted about 100 strikes. Right on our path, we try to contact them, let them know we're turning, but I'm, I'm not waiting for permission on this one. We're just going. Landing at night at a strange airport in a severe storm. It's about as bad as it gets. <sighs> but it's about to get worse. Gotta go left, gotta go left. Yeah, this is some serious wind. 50 mile an hour wind blow you all over the place. Stu guides the lightweight Cirrus with the help of the autopilot. Double the wings, you're gonna get blown left again. But in these winds, the autopilot can't keep up. If it goes left again, once it catches uh, that left hand, I'm hat flying it. All right. Stu flies by hand to stay on course. But Kerry has 20 years of hand flying, and for him, nothing's happening fast enough. Easy, 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 easy. easy, easy. easy. You're, down to, you're going down a thousand feet a minute. Level points, level up, level up. Kerry yards on the stick. Hey, 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 get us up. All right, all right, all right. feet over the water. You're going down a thousand feet a minute. We're good, we're good. Sorry, man. And one another. You are not recovering. It's all right. The airplane has it, all right? Don't let the airplane do the work for you. The airplane did not have it. We we're going down a thousand feet a minute. Kerry doesn't trust the autopilot to bring them down safely in this weather. I got it now. I'm just trying to get the thing over, all right? So Don't down. have to turn that fast. Go now. Stu's an old hand at flying the Cirrus. And on this run, he's the captain. Oh, you're getting blown. Oh, man, it's windy up here. Holy f***. Hey, chop your power. You're gonna ah, dude, that's on. just... Shh, shh. Please. Uh, one oh. for, uh, yeah, you may evacuate. Maybe it's his training as a firefighter, but under pressure and with his co-pilot barking at him, Stu keeps his cool. Pops up, thank you. I don't respond to yelling. I never have, I never will. We are in a life-threatening situation that demands 100% focus, and anything that's taken my focus away from that could kill us. But outside the cockpit, neither pilot is giving an inch. You know, when you grab the stick, which is the scariest feeling for me to have someone do, when you grabbed it, it was, I was We were in a steep to, bank. We were in a very steep, steep bank. We were in a steep bank. We were in a very we steep bank. You were trying too hard to re-intercept that, and we were all of a sudden going way down real fast. We were in a, I just, it, was, it wasn't bad yet, but I wasn't going to let it get any worse. Yeah. But I was holding it. I, was, but, I wasn't in its freaking snow and die, but, but grabbing but the... Was, you weren't correcting it fast enough for me. I wasn't yeah. going to let it go. But that's, it, that's the thing. I wasn't doing it fast enough for you, but I was on it. I was I like... Didn't, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. It helps. It helps a little bit when I get the, uh, some peace when I'm when I'm trying to land in 50 mile an hour crosswinds. But it's hard for me to focus on all the variables that I'm trying to do and have you yelling at me and saying stuff it's like, "Oh God, just shh, 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 just." Shh. Well, I can't. I, know. I don't want to die either. So yeah. you know, I'm trying to help. I've got a wife and kids to come home to. Bottom line is, if I see something dangerous about to happen, I'm going to prevent it from happening one way or the other. If that means i got to grab the controls and piss somebody off, well, then that's what I'm going to do. But uh, hopefully I have a little bit of faith that I can fly this aircraft and I can land it. I don't trust it. anybody. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. The bigger problem is that together, they will soon face one of the most dangerous crossings in the world. Your best buddy. Cold. Your best buddy at 22,000. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> it defies the odds that Corey and Randy are in the air at all. The geriatric Cheyenne, with its bad history of problems and repairs, has somehow carried them more than 3,000 kilometers from Alaska into Russia. Life is good. Chasing that sun. They have a heater. The cockpit heater is helping combat the minus 40 degree temperatures outside. That wasn't always the case. We got things freezing up. We got nuts and bolts freezing up. On earlier flights, 
the Cheyenne revealed a low tolerance for the cold. We got a windshield that won't defrost. This is one thing after another. But fixes to the cockpit and windshield heaters are holding up. And in sub-zero temperatures, that's critical. November 800 Echo Bravo, Houston, Vietnam. We're going to land 10 Echo Bravo. Gonna be a skating rink. Dude, I'm glad we made it, man. That was a long day. Made some good ground, though. By morning, there she is, looking stout on the ramp. The temperature is pinned at minus 31 degrees. It's a little cold, Captain. <laughs> Got awesome weather. It's going to be a good day to fly if our airplane goes together. Yeah. <laughs> if she starts. The problem plagued Cheyenne needs a big thaw job. Oh, there's the heater truck. That's old school Russian right there. At this airport, there are no hangers and no de-icing fluid. I've never seen anything like this before. And this relic is the Soviet solution. I don't know. You think that's World War II era? <laughs> and what this truck's going to do is put heat on our engines to preheat the engines. Trying to get this plane warmed up so we can get it started. What do you think, Granny? Negative 30 right now? I don't know. My face hurts. I put one of the heaters inside the cabin. I mean, I think the engines are going to start up fine. The avionics is what's got me worried. Well, we got to go. And today's our day to do it. If we can make it out, a lot of our troubles behind us, I think. I hope. All right, Corey, here we go. Let's get out of Magadan. Dude, it is cold. Man. I never thought we were going to get here, let alone get out of here, but it's time to go. You're even putting in the air, man. It's on. My feet are so cold, they hurt, man. I think that heater's working. I just recycled it. Pray to God it works. But in this moody Cheyenne, tempting fate is a bad idea. That heater's not working, man. Holy. My toes are frozen. Oh, uh, are you okay? The heater's not working. They're at 24,000 feet. The outside temperature is minus 45 degrees. Flight time, four hours. How come every time I'm in an airplane with you, I find myself in a situation I've never been in before? It's usually a bad situation. Holy crap, did you feel Together, that? they've pulled through storms. We're, we're down to two minutes. Come on, baby. And engine scares. That's a bad feeling, man. They battled the dark. All you can see is black. Exhaustion and a cockpit explosion. <laughs> what was that? That could have ended in disaster. Why did the heater have to break here? Hypothermia is a brand new menace, and just as lethal. My toes hurt. I mean, I'm a little concerned. Uh, we got to keep moving them, you know? Stu Sprung and Kerry McCauley approached the northeast coast of Scotland. I set control to number 158 Papa Golf, level 8,000. No, no the last stop before launching across the North Atlantic. Flaps to zero. Up to zero. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. No applause. But the guy waiting for them at the hangar... We're ready. Okay. Right. ...has something more important. A critical weather forecast. And this afternoon, from about 3 o'clock onwards, it's all lifting till basically a clear excellent, sky. Excellent, For the North Atlantic in the winter, it's a beautiful day. Well, if they all went with a forecast like that, they're all gonna live. <laughs> but they don't. On their journey from Singapore to Ohio, 
Carrie and Stu have covered nearly 13 and a half thousand kilometers in 10 days. But the next leg is the most dangerous, close to 3,700 kilometers of open ocean with a couple of risky landings in between. I got it. And winter is at the door. So if you notice how empty the hangar is? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at that right now. I'm noticing that we are the only private aircraft in this hangar. Right now. Yeah, it uh, kind of tells you something that all the ferry flights that uh, take the northern route have come and gone for the season. Yeah. Except is... for us. The crossing will be a tall order for the small Cirrus and its one propeller. And for pilot Kerry McCauley, it's not just late in the year, it's late in his career. You know, I've, I've done a lot of ocean crossings, and I'm not really 100% sure how I feel about them anymore. You know, I don't really get scared or nervous, but there's always something in the back of the mind that's telling me this is maybe a little dumb. You know, I haven't done a single engine North Atlanta crossing in 12 years, and I kind of thought I'd retired from that. Here I am, facing the old girl again. This is the real deal. I can see my breath. That's awesome. Over Russia, Corey and Randy may as well be flying a refrigerator. I don't know what it's going to be, but when you pay me back, it's going to be huge. <laughs> <laughs> Not big, huge. From the trip start, the Cheyenne was dogged by an unreliable heater. Now, it's officially gone AWOL. Grandpa, why do you only have two toes? <laughs> well, son, there was one day Randy forced me to go on this flight with him. <laughs> da, 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 da. Corey, how much would you give me if I stick my tongue to that metal? <laughs> Ah! <laughs> How much longer? Two hours, 37 minutes, sir. <laughs> but the laughs will only keep you warm for so long. Holy shit, it's negative 50 now. Might even be colder, because the gauge is pegged. And our bags are up front, or else we could at least get some sweatshirts and stuff and put down on our feet. I put my hat down there. Any other time, I'd, I would have canceled our flight, you know? It's too cold, I mean, it's just too tough, Look, man. Just... My feet are numb and hurt. Corey and Randy are in a danger zone, right in their own cockpit. They're losing body heat fast. I'm going to put another map down here. It's not high-grade insulation, but every bit helps. Maps actually work pretty good. So, do we have me another one? Here, one of our favorite places, a nice, warm Australia. Ah. Hypothermia can rob a pilot of his judgment and reaction time. And Corey and Randy have two more hours of this. We have to be extremely careful that none of this stuff gets caught in the rudders and the rudder pedals. I've been flying for 26 years. Uh, I've never heard of a situation like this. It started out kind of funny and, hey, this is really cold, and then it got really cold, and then it got serious. Yeah, it hurts to touch my feet. Holy In Scotland, Carrie and Stu are impatient to pull the trigger on their epic transatlantic crossing. We gotta get a flight plan going too. Let's start take a look at some the, weather. Uh, our, can we turn, can we get one and get moving pretty quickly in an hour? Five minutes. Five minutes? Don't take on a ferry flight if you've got a deadline to meet. Because that's the real killer. 
Chief Ground Handler Andrew Bruce has watched ferry flyers roll in and out for more than two decades. So what, uh, how many How many guys are going in the water a year here? Three a year die. So what do they do wrong? They just, they... What do they do wrong? I mean, they just get involved in weather that really isn't compatible with that aircraft. And occasionally they, they run out of fuel because the winds on the Atlantic have got a habit of not being what they are when they're forecasted. <laughs> I didn't think I'd be doing this again, but here we go. And before this trip is out, hey, Papa, call. Trip is they'll both be reminded just how unpredictable a North Atlantic winter can be. <laughs> Nearly 8,000 kilometers away, Corey Benson and Randy McGee are in a Russian deep freeze. My hands are so cold, I can't f them. The Cheyenne's heater broke down more than four hours ago. My feet hurt so bad, and it's so hard to move right now. I'm a little worried about manipulating the controls on landing, you know? But go hit the brakes, and your feet just wouldn't work. And as they close in on the airport, it's not just their bodies that are slowing down in the cold. See the airport? No. Uh, be at our three to four o'clock. Corey's confused left and right, pointing Randy in the wrong direction. Three, four. I'm five. sorry, dude. Man. November, are you ready to land? Uh, we're ready to land, sir. I mean, the main difficulty on this approach right now is us, Corey. We're uh, we're cold. We're distracted. Our hands, our feet aren't moving that well. I don't know if that's affecting our judgment or our uh, thinking very much, but because I don't know that for sure, I assume that it is. So we gotta be extra careful, double, triple check everything. Descent to height, one, two, zero, zero meters. We're cleared for uh, one six, descent to one six meters. Or, I'm sorry, one six zero zero meters. But even with the correction, Randy's called out the wrong altitude, the kind of screw-up that can drop you into the same space as another plane. Air traffic control catches Randy's mistake. One, two, zero, zero meters, thank you, uh, 800 Echo Bravo. Altitude corrected, but then, Okay, clear land uh, on uh, 25 uh, right for 800 Echo Bravo. We're going to the right. Another major error. Thundering in at 200 kilometers an hour and 300 meters off the ground, Randy has mixed up his runways. Uh, clear to land runway 25 left. Okay, 25 left, 800 Echo Bravo. Stop in Russia. Get it cold. <laughs> Let's get the hell out of this cold. Let's go get some vodka. Glad we made it, man. Well done, dude. I'm just well glad done, we made man. it this far. And we still got all, all our fingers and toes. Halfway around the world and even further north, the temperature is 45 degrees warmer for Corey's pilots, Stu Sprung and Kerry McCauley. It's uh, a little warmer than I was anticipating. We're five degrees uh, above freezing. It's a little better. We have no icing problems just yet. Boy, that tailwind is really nice right now. This leg is a butt. They put 16,000 kilometers behind them and are now over Greenland. It's low stress flying and the sometimes testy mood in the cockpit is downright neighborly. Everybody good? Everybody happy? 
super happy. 158, Papa Golf, go ahead. Trial back. Trial back right now. About 30 minutes from landing, fog has shut the airport. Hey, Pup Golf, Roger. And that's why you save all the gas you can. This is a killer. This is exactly what we did not need today. We're way past the point. No, we're, yeah, we're physically over Greenland right now. So there's no turning back. Exactly the sort of thing I hate. But in Greenland, the weather changes really quick. Big old front moves in or something and shuts the airport down. What's the uh, what's the alternate uh, nuke? Maybe we can reach anything. It's a problem. The alternates are it's not close enough. They scramble to see if the weather's better at another airport and if they have the gas to get there. Nurse Hazard Radio, Sonderstrom Radio. Remember one five eight Papa Go. They've lost radio contact. How do we lose them? <laughs> we're getting closer to land and we're over land. Now in a real emergency, their survival depends on fast thinking and tight teamwork. While Carrie works the radio, Stu grabs the satellite phone. Hello, this is uh, Stu, uh, the pilots from November 158 Papa Golf. Can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm on uh, the satellite phone, it's really loud, can you hear me? The ex-firefighter and the pro skydiver are used to escaping tense situations, but here, their hands are tied. All they can do is hover until the weather or the radio reception improve. That's so frustrating, that damn thing. I want to throw it out the window so bad. We won't be able to hold our altitude here pretty soon. They're burning through fuel. And if airport fog doesn't soon lift, there's just one option open, and it's strictly Hollywood. You can always put it down on the glacier. It's probably uh, not a real smooth landing, but survivable. At least we won't be in the water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number 158, Pop Gulf, uh, you're coming in broke again. Uh, call you back a few minutes. I'm not digging getting this. Looks like a little iced up, though. Oh. Sasserac, November 158, Papago. Any uh, update on their conditions? The radio has sputtered back to life, bringing good news. The fog is clearing for now. Hey, Papago, Roger, we are 5 1 DME out, uh, heading back to Narcessor. It got better, but it could get worse. At this point, we've got to land at Narcessor right now. But you can't rush this landing. High mountains and a steep descent make it one of the most dangerous in the world. Get ready. To, you're going way too fast. Slow it down. Slow it down. Stu knows this plane, but Carrie's flown this approach many times. In a half mile, you're supposed to be going 900 feet a minute at 90. And his old impulse to take control in risky, fast-moving situations kicks back in. Okay, chop it. Chop it, approach flaps. Down we go. Quick, 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 quick. Down we go, down we go. Okay, not quite that fast. 900 feet a minute. You're doing 15. All powered out. Stu hasn't lost his instinct to filter the noise. Don't go any lower. Don't go any lower. Okay, okay. It's, on the, it's on this side. It's not in that hill. It's over here. Oh, got a sight. Run my inside for your Papa Golf. <laughs> Stu aced the landing, but there's no time for high fives. It's like we're lucky we got in when we did. Yeah. It's coming down again. Yeah, it's like we got a little flurry. Before the weather boxes them in, they score a fast refuel and lift off again, this time bound for North America.
two oceans and a continent away. Oh my God, what a change in the elements. Corey and Randy have traveled from hypothermia to heat exhaustion. Going from negative 50 degrees to sweating like crazy. From sitting in the fetal position, worried my toes are gonna fall off, to sitting here can't stop sweating. Dude, we're almost there. This has been a bear of a trip. From Florida, across North America, over the top of the world, through Russia, Asia, and now closing in on their final destination, the Philippines. Capitan, I can't imagine doing this flight without you, bro. Thanks, man, I appreciate that. I have a feeling you'd be going to my funeral. Seriously, a tough flight, man. A laundry list of serious mechanical problems means they're rolling in six weeks late. But we're almost there, five minutes. But the old troublesome Cheyenne isn't done with them yet. That exhaust pipe is rattling crazy. Rattling? Vibrating. The worry? That the right engine is about to bite the dust. The one thing we haven't had problems with is the engines till now and we're on approach. Gotta get this plane on the ground, man. Come on, baby. A couple more minutes. They cross their fingers and make for the runway. We're not going around. Clear to land 06. Clear to land 06 for 800 acre bravo. 800 acre bravo. Clear to land. Clear to land 06. Clear to land 06 for 800 acre bravo. 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 Clear
Gulf winds are calm, clear to land. At the end of 20,000 kilometers, Stu and Carrie are guiding the Cirrus to its new Ohio home. The line 24 left, 8 Papa Gulf. And some things never change. Hey, yep, better start your turn. Don't pull through it. Start your turn. Two degrees. I good? That's pretty good. Carrie had trouble giving up the captain's seat to the less experienced Stu. Up, Thank you. But he can't argue with success. So you are no longer a Atlantic Ferry Pilot Virgin. That is true, dude. Thanks to you. you have crossed the big blue. In two weeks, they flew 20,000 kilometers. That's halfway around the world, through some of the most dangerous territory anywhere. That's no small thing. That's just not getting up, going into the office, coming home at 5, having dinner, and watching TV. This is the complete opposite of that. You did a good job, bud. Captain Thanks, Sprung. I, I needed you there, dude. This was the largest, most epic thing I've been able to do, and I'm so happy that you were there because you are, it made it so much easier. You are now one of a, a tiny fraction of humanity who's ever captained a single-engine piston over the North Atlantic, especially in the wintertime. Now that it's done, pretty proud of both Stu and I. Man, I just flew a single-engine piston halfway around the world. You gotta be proud of that, you know? It's, I just I just smile thinking about it. It's just pretty cool. I'll take care of the plane. You, you can boogie, you know, you gotta catch that flight. In the plane oh, delivery man. business, a trip's end. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. No problem. Thank awesome you. trip. Time. It's just an excuse to start the next adventure. Now, in Dubai, that's exactly what boss Corey Benson is doing. It's showtime. Mr. Aman Sore, how are you? Very nice to finally meet you. Me too. He's chasing the money in the Middle East. Hello, how are you? Corey Benson. Opening a second office. Do we have any meetings scheduled for today? Yeah, we have like two meetings today okay. after the press conference. I'm glad to be here. This is one of the biggest milestones that our company has ever Said had. Alman. Opening the second headquarters down here in Dubai, really expanding into the Middle East and into the African markets. This is big. Here, buying, selling, and delivering planes is a multi-billion dollar industry and growing. Corey's own bottom line in his first year of business was in the hundreds of thousands. And it's been one wild ride. I've seen so many amazing countries. I've met so many amazing people around the world. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I've flown so many different types of airplanes. And riding out a lot of the tough stuff with a seasoned pro never hurts. You rocked on that approach. My pilot skills have increased tremendously, and I attribute a lot of that to flying with Randy. It's been an incredible experience to fly with him and, and watch and learn. Together, Corey, Randy, and the top-notch team of ferry pilots have touched down in 39 countries and logged more than 123,000 kilometers, over three times the circumference of the planet. Corey's already planning the next leg of his own epic journey. We're doing the craziest flights you can possibly imagine, and, and we've got some crazy guys to do it. <laughs> OK, kind of pathetic, but it's all we got. For a guy who risked everything on this gamble, the payback is sweet. There's nothing cooler than, than what I do. 